we are going to start start the meeting. Um, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here this evening. My name is Allie Ryan Hansen. I'm the communications manager for the Oregon Department of State Lands and your moderator for tonight's meeting about the request the department has received to sell 400 acres of school lands at Klein Buttes. Here is our agenda for tonight. Should be popping up on the screen any second here. I'm gonna take this opportunity, oh, there we go. I'm gonna let you all know that I have a toddler and a cat. Um, and so if you're hearing things in the background, it's gonna be one of those two things. Okay, perfect, thanks, Leanne. Um, so the, our agenda for this evening um, is up on the screen. Department staff is first gonna provide an overview of the due diligence process and the information that's been collected to help inform a future decision about the potential sale. That'll be followed by time for you to ask questions about due diligence. We'll then spend the rest of the time together hearing your comments on the potential sale. I do wanna note that we are recording, we are recording the meeting um, and the recording will be posted to DSL's YouTube channel. Hey Leanne, will you restart the meeting? Leanne or Amber, I think one of you guys is gonna to have to do that because they're sharing on my end. Um, we intend to record the meeting and post it to DSL's YouTube channel. We're also using Zoom live transcription feature to enhance meeting accessibility. Um, before we get started, I do wanna be clear. We know folks are interested in and have perspectives on the development of properties adjacent to the tract. DSL does not have a decision-making in the proposed development or in evaluating any future development that may or may not take place after school lands are sold. DSL and the State Land Board are specifically considering whether to retain or sell the school lands at Klein Buttes. Please keep that in mind this evening. Okay. Um, we hope this will be an informative um, and positive experience for everyone with that goal in mind. Here are our expectations for this evening. First, um, be respectful of each other and DSL representatives. People have very different perspectives on this potential sale and ensuring that all are heard is really important to us. Please avoid interrupting or reacting to what others are saying. Um, finally, criticism is a very important part of a healthy public process. Just remember to direct criticism at ideas and not people. Please do keep your mic muted unless it's your turn to speak. We have a lot of people here tonight and more are joining us all the time. Um, so staying muted, muted helps you hear us and us hear you. Um, please also provide comments during the hearing portion of the meeting. As I said, there is going to be time for a few questions after the due diligence presentation. Um, please resist any temptation to jump ahead and provide a comment during question time. We do wanna be fair to folks who have questions. Um, I will talk more in a minute about how we'll take questions and how, how um, um, comments, um, I'll review that, how we'll take comments, I'll review that later in the meeting. Um, finally, please do heed any reminders to follow these guidelines. It's my job tonight to create a positive meeting environment. Um, I take that job very seriously. I am very, very bad at confrontation, but if someone isn't following these guidelines, I will remind them to do so. And after that, I may ask someone to leave the meeting or remove them from the meeting. Okay, with that um, introductions, we have several members of DSL's team here tonight. It's my pleasure to introduce Bill Ryan, um, DSL's Deputy Director of Operations. Bill, <laughs> There's so many folks here, I'm not sure if folks can see you, but if you could wave, that would be great. The folks know who they're looking at. Um, we also have Sean Zumwalt and John Swanson with our Real Property Program, who are going to be presenting on due diligence in just a moment. And then, as I mentioned, DSL's Leanne O'Neill and Amber McKernan um, are also here providing technical support. We're not using the chat feature tonight, but you can still direct chat Leanne or Amber with any meeting logistics questions. Um, there will be time for questions about due diligence following the presentation. We are gonna use the Zoom's raise hand feature um, to, to have you all indicate that you wanna ask a question. 
Um, that Zoom raise hands feature can be found by clicking the reactions button, which is the little smiley face at the bottom of the screen. If you click that, there's a button there that lets you raise your hand and mine's up now. And if you click again, there's a button there that says lower hand. So that's how you take it down. Okay. Okay, with that, I believe we are ready to get started um, with the due diligence presentation. Sean and John, though, I am gonna ask you to hang out for just, hold on for just a minute. Our recording has stopped um, and I want to make sure that we start it for your presentation so that we can put that on the web for everybody to see. All right, there we go, folks. I believe we have resumed the recording. I'm going to turn the floor over to John Swanson and Sean Zumwalt. Good evening, everyone. My name is John Swanson, and I am a real property planner with the Department of State Lands. And I'm going to begin this evening with some context on DSL's management of school lands. In 1859, upon statehood, the federal government granted Oregon 3.4 million acres of school lands to support public ed education. About 772,000 acres of these school lands remain in state ownership today. School lands are managed by the Department of State Lands on behalf of the State Land Board to generate revenue for the Common School Fund, which sends millions of dollars to Oregon K-12 public schools every year. In 2022, $64.2 million from the Common School Fund will go to Oregon schools. The revenue from school lands comes from leases for uses like grazing cattle, as well as from sale of lands. The department manages school lands for their long-term potential to generate revenue. This includes using best management practices to ensure these school lands are healthy and can continue to send funds to Oregon school children for future generations to come, either through leases or future sales. I'll go into the land sales process. The department has received an application from Central Land and Capital and Cattle Company, LLC, that's Central Land and Cattle Company, LLC, to purchase 400 acres of school lands in Deschutes County. The six lots, known as the Klein Buttes Tract, are located near Clyden Falls Road and Eagle Crest Resort. First, I'll give a quick overview of the state's process for considering a potential sale of school lands. When the department receives an application to purchase land, we perform an initial review to assess whether the state would potentially sell these school lands. We evaluate the lands requested and determine whether selling them could have more income potential for the common school fund than other possible income generating uses of the property. During that initial review, we identify a potential method by which the school lands may be sold. When the state is considering selling school lands, it's important for the public to know that not only that the lands will potentially be sold, but how they will potentially be sold. When the applicant is leasing the land or owns adjacent land, the potential method of sale is often a direct sale to the applicant. In this case, the Klein Buttes track is leased to Central Land and Cattle Company, LLC, for open space use and access to adjacent properties that the applicant owns. For this reason, the potential method under consideration will be a direct sale. If initial review determines the state may want to sell school lands, DSL then requests permission from the state land board to fully evaluate the potential sale through a due diligence process. During due diligence, DSL gathers information about many factors that affect a property's short and long-term potential to generate revenue for schools. For example, property information like zoning, accessibility, and proximity to infrastructure all help DSL evaluate the property's potential. Presence of mineral resources, cultural resources, or wildlife can also affect a property's potential. DSL also asks the public to comment on the public sale, and that's what we're doing this evening. All the information that's gathered during the due diligence process is evaluated and provided to the state land board, which then decides whether to sell the school lands. 
the overarching consideration for school land sale decisions is adhering to both Admission Act and constitutional responsibilities. First, the Admission Act responsibilities. The Admission Act granted lands to Oregon specifically, quote, for the use of schools. The land board must ensure that school lands are sold or managed with a focus on benefiting, benefiting the common school fund. For constitutional responsibilities, the land board is obligated to, quote, manage lands under its jurisdiction with the object of obtaining the greatest benefit for the benefit of this state, consistent with the conservation of this resource under sound techniques of land management, end quote. Oregon administrative rule for sale of school lands, specifically state school lands, will be sold in a manner that adheres absolutely to both the Admission Act and our constitutional responsibilities. So that's the general overview of the school land sale process. And I'm now going to hand over the presentation to my colleague in the Real Property Division of State Lands, uh, Sean Zumwald. So Sean, take it from here. Uh, thank you, John. I appreciate that. Hi, folks. Uh, I'm Sean Zumwalt, property manager with the Department of State Lands Real Property Program. I'm based in Central Oregon. Uh, so I'm going to talk specifically about the Klein Buttes tract. I'll start with an overview of the tract, and then I'll walk through the information DSL has gathered during the due diligence process, which the State Land Board authorized to begin in October 2021. The Klein Buttes tract is comprised of six tax lots, shown here on the map on this map in blue totaling approximately 400 acres. Three of the lots are surrounded by private lands owned by the applicant. Those applicant owned lands are shown in pink on the map. Uh, the other three lots share a border with the private lands on at least one side. Those same lots are also adjacent to lands owned by the Bureau of Land Management shown in orange. Uh, the tract has one right of way that crosses tax lots 5104, 5103, 5102, and 5200. Uh, the right of way was granted by the Bureau of Land Management to the applicant in 2007 before DSL acquired the lot from BLM. Uh, the right of way is for a road that enables the applicant to access the adjacent properties that they currently own. Uh, the right of way acts as an easement that allows Central Land and Cattle Company to continue to use this road for access, even if the land changes ownership. It's essentially a right of way that will always stay with the land regardless of who owns the land. Uh, there's also a right of way on tax lot 5101 for Central Electric Co-op's existing transmission line and it allows them to continue to access that line for repairs or maintenance. Uh, others cannot legally access the school lands because there are no legal agreements in place that allow access from the adjoining private or BLM lands. Uh, this lack of legal access has made it difficult for the DSL to manage uh, this tract. Um, as part of our due diligence, the DSL has re received a preliminary title report to confirm our ownership of the tract and identify any potential liens and our easements. Um, there are no liens associated with the tract, but there is an additional telephone pool easement on tax lot 5300. Uh, we're currently in the process of having an appraisal conducted by a third party state licensed commercial appraiser to determine the market value of the tract. Um, and this is done in order to maximize revenue sent to the common school fund. And DSL is required to obtain full fair market value for any school lands sold, regardless of the method of sale. Uh, if the potential direct sale is approved, uh, the sale price would be of course at the appraised market value of the land. Um, DSL has also gathered information about basic characteristics of the, the land that <clears throat> affect potential value, like zoning, uh, soil types, nearby power sources, and uh, other things like that. Um, the tract has been zoned by Deschutes County as combined exclusive farm use, as well as uh, with the destination resort overlay. That and other characteristics are reported in a land evaluation form. Uh, we've also gathered information about development in the surrounding area as development <coughs> activity on adjacent lands can affect the value of school lands. Deschutes County provided an update this week actually um, on the status of the proposed resort development on adjacent lands owned by the applicant. Uh, that's available on our website as an addendum to the staff report. Uh, the department has evaluated the tract to assess whether there may be 
any cultural resources present, um, archaeological sites or, or artifacts associated with people from the past. Uh, for these assessments, uh, DSL's archaeologist reviews the database of the state, uh, state Historic Preservation Office to determine if any cultural resources have been identified on DSL tax lots. Um, that initial review showed that no sites were found on any of the DSL tax lots. Um, SHPO did identify um, that all of the tax lots except for tax lot 5300 were fully surveyed in 2007. Um, and no archaeological sites or artifacts were found through those surveys. However, past surveys of other nearby properties within two miles of the tract have found multiple sites and artifacts. Due to this, DSL has determined that there is a moderately high probability that there may be cultural resources on site. This tells DSL any potential cell would need to be conditioned to protect those resources. Uh, DSL will provide an inadvertent discovery plan or an IDP to in any potential purchaser and construction crews to instruct them on the steps to protect any cultural resources that may be found if any development was to occur on this property. Um, we also requested a mineral resource assessment from the Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industries, uh, DOGAMI, uh, to determine whether there may be any mineral or energy resources on the tract. The report indicated that there is a low potential for high value mineral or energy, energy resources. Uh, there is some potential that there could be industrial minerals on site, like basalt and rhyolite um, on site that are typically used in construction. Uh, this tells DSL that if the land is sold, the subsurface mineral rights can be included in the cell as there are no minerals of significant value. Uh, we have evaluated the presence of wildlife on site. A report from the Oregon Biodiversity Information Center, or ORBIC, found that there have been no plants or species identified on the Klein Beach tract that are state or federally listed as endangered, threatened, or sensitive on site. Um, some milk bitch, which is a perennial plant listed as threatened by the state, have been found to grow within a two mile radius of the tract. However, the Klein Buttes tract have, has been surveyed twice and no milk bitch have been found. Additionally, staff have determined that milk bitch does not typically grow in the soil types found on the tract. And that's based on national soil survey maps and the tracks sloped topography. Uh, Golden Eagle's nest has been identified within 0.6 miles of the tract. If any development occurs within this range of the nesting site, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service would recommend a permit be acquired prior to any activity. Uh, we've also reviewed wildlife maps. The lands within the tract are identified by the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife as big game win winter range. <clears throat> this does not affect the potential sell, but if the land is sold, the new owner would need to follow county land use laws before any development occurs. Overall, the information gathered about wildlife tells DSL that an additional permitting process would be recommended, as would consultation with the county regarding wildlife permitted land use as part of any future potential development on the tract. We've also collected information on, on how the tract is being currently used. These properties, as many of you know, are used for public recreation, including hiking, biking, and horseback riding. While recreation is allowed on school lands, DSL does not specifically manage school lands for recreation, and we do not create or maintain any trails. Uh, recreators either access the lands through the adjacent private lands, including the nearby Eagle Crest Resort or via BLM. Um, but just as a reminder, there is no legal access to this property. Uh, the, the Klein Buttes recreation area is immediately adjacent to the tract. And this area, which is managed by the BLM, offers approximately 32,000 acres of lands available for public recreation. These lands are maintained for public use and do include trails and trailheads. In addition to this area, there are thousands of acres um, of other recreation uh, lands within a five mile radius of the tract, um, including the Northwest Recreation Area, the Steamboat Rock Recreation Area, the Tumalo Recreation Area, and the Ben Redmond, Redmond Recreation Area. Um, we have also reviewed DSL's records and data from the Oregon Water Resources Department and determined that there are no water rights or permits for the tract. 
Um, this tells DSL that water cannot be sourced from these lands without applying to the Oregon Water Resources Department to purchase or transfer water rights. Both application processes would require extensive public review. Um, and again, this is an application process through the Oregon Water Resources Department. Uh, finally, due diligence includes gathering public feedback on the potential sale. Um, again, uh, this is what we're here tonight for in part. Uh, comments provide important perspective on the potential sale of the land as DSL considers whether selling or retaining the tract provides the best outcome for the Collins School Fund. The public comment period has been open since January um, 24th, 2022, um, and co comments can continue to be made through March 17th. Uh, that concludes our presentation uh, of the information collected during due diligence. We will now be happy to answer any questions about due diligence, uh, the due diligence process as it relates to the decision to sell or retain these lands. <clears throat> as a reminder, DSL does not have a rule in land development process and cannot answer any questions about current development statuses or future development process. These questions are best directed to the county. I'll give that back to you, Allie. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, John. Okay, we now have time for questions. And um, we're gonna take about 10 minutes to answer any questions that folks have. I see hands raised already. Um, and I'll start calling on folks in just a second. But as a reminder, raise your hand by clicking reactions near the bottom of your screen um, and pressing raise hand, or if you're on the phone, it's star nine. We have a number of folks who wanna ask questions. So um, we, to help us answer as many as we can, please ask one question at a time. If you have more than one, re-raise your hand and we'll come back to you as time allows. Um, remember again, this is the time for questions. Time for comments is later. And with that, um, Deschutes, Desch, Lower Deschutes River, Lower Deschutes River, you are first. Oh, please I'm Mary ahead. Fleischman and I'm more with, uh, for comment than questions. So I'll put my hand down. All right, thanks, Mary. Okay, the next person that's got their hand up to ask a question is Vicki Hickman. Vicki, go right ahead. Yeah, my question is, how do you go about selling this property? What's the process? I'll answer that. The process, uh, which we described briefly earlier, is that when a, a person applies to purchase state lands, uh, we go through uh, an evaluation, which we're doing tonight with our due diligence process, and then staff will develop a report for the state land board to determine whether or not a sale is applicable on the property that's been applied to be purchased and what the method of sale will be. And as we described earlier, uh, as the applicant is a lessee and owns property adjacent to the property that's been applied to purchase. Uh, right now, we are examining a direct sale at fair market value, fair market appraised value to the applicant. That's the process. The state land board will determine whether or not the sale occurs at a later time. This is just strictly to gather information in preparation for a report for the state land board. Um, if, if someone has adjacent land to this piece of property, but didn't know that the state was going to put it up for sale, are they then going to be notified that they potentially could be in the market for that property also? Sean, do you want to ask, answer that question? Uh, well, this, yeah, like you had said, that this is a, uh opportunity for us to open up for due diligence to see if it's even going to be sold. Um, but if there's interest, I mean, there's nothing, this is, this is open. I mean, for opportunity for people to um, kind of review their comments. And if there's an interest, I don't, I don't see why they couldn't submit, um, you know, their interest and in, in apply as well. It may change. Well, I think if you're really going to sell it, um, I think it's, the state should notify people with adjacent property. I mean, I've looked at the map. Um, and the map Vicky, Vicky, thank you for your thank you for your questions. Um, we you. do want to make sure other folks have a chance to ask their questions. But I believe, and I know Sean and John will correct me if I'm wrong, that the notice process for the potential sale when we receive the application 
and sent out the public notice, the adjacent landowners are notified that the property okay. was potentially be That's correct. That's correct. Great. Okay. Perfect. The next person up for questions is Ivan. Ivan, go right ahead and unmute and ask your question. So as far as the due diligence process and the data that's used, um, I've looked at the documents uh, most recently from Cattle Co. and Deschutes County. Is this data, the data from their employees, the Newtons, or is this uh, third party? Um, with the, the information that we receive is um, either from another state agency or from reviews that we conducted on our own. Um, we don't get provided data from the applicant. Okay. Um, my other question has to do with the constitutional responsibilities. Ivan, I'm sorry, we're doing one question at a time to ensure that other folks have the opportunity okay. to ask. So I would put your hand down and then put it back up again and then that'll send you to the back of the queue to, and we'll come back to you if we've got time. Okay, um, at the top of the line is Seth Eisenberg. Um, Seth, please go ahead and unmute and ask your question. And Kate Hofstad, you are after that. But Seth, you're up first. Can you hear me okay? We sure can. All right. Um, so my question is, um, in the context of uh, the larger development that this is uh, a part of, has there been an EIS uh, associated with that? And is that taken into account by the, by the DSL in a contemplating a sale? Well, with regard to the, the development, that's not something that we're reviewing, but as far as uh, there was an environmental assessment that was conducted uh, when that right of way was issued by the BLM. Um, so a lot of work was done through that process, um, but that was again, prior to DSL acquiring the property. Thanks, Sean. Okay. Um, not a follow-on question, but just a clarification. Can any of that be posted publicly as part of the, the DSL record? I don't see it in the, at, at the uh, site. I you don't, don't have to answer now, but that'd be a request if that's possible. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Kate Hofstad, you are up next. Yeah, thank you. Is there a rating system or um, any way that we can understand how you might weigh, say, what percentage of your decision will be public comment and what percentage might be other elements of your rubric in choosing, um, yeah, who or to make a direct sale to? I'll answer that. Uh, we, through our rules and our process by which we conduct due, due diligence at uh, the direction of the state land board, we gather all the information and then it's the land board members themselves that will uh, evaluate all of the information gathered in the due diligence oh, process shit. and then. Uh, no, yes. And the land board themselves will then make a decision at a later time based on all the information gathered. So in terms of, of how it's scored or any sort of a rubricon is not part of the evaluation done by staff during due diligence. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, John. Okay, the next question is going to be from Tim Benish. Um, then after Tim, we'll go to Paul Kleisens, whose name I'm sure I have just mangled, but Tim, it's your turn now, and then we'll go to Paul. Ali did a great job with my name. Thank you very much. My question is very specific. Um, how was the land acquired in 2007? And what was, it per what was its purpose at that time? The land was purchased. The, 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 the federal government still owes Oregon a significant number of acres uh, in that original land grant that started its statehood. So over time, we evaluate federal properties that are available for disposal by the federal government to be acquired by the Department of State Lands and to be included into our uh, asset base of properties to benefit the Common School Fund. So in 2007, these properties became available to us from the federal government, and that was when we acquired them. 
Um, okay, thanks. All right, thanks, John. Um, Paul, you are up. You are up next. Paul, Paul Kysons, are you there? I'm very likely mispronouncing your name. I'm wondering if he's, oh. Sorry, I do apologize. <clears throat> I couldn't unmute. That's um, quite all right, go ahead. Um, it's, I have a question with regards to the due diligence in respect to cultural resources on the DSL parcels. Um, my understanding from the presentation was that it was um, a review of the of the information in the Oregon SHPO database um, <clears throat> that was utilized primarily at, at this round. Um, is that correct? Yeah, so the, the state's archaeologist, uh, the Oregon Department of State Lands archaeologist reviewed SHPO's database to see if there were any known sites on the property. Um, none were seen, and then he uh, reviewed the fact that they had um, several surveys um, on on most of the DSL tracks. There was one tax lot that did not have a physical survey done. Um, but uh, yeah, so so this, there was a physical survey on most of the property, um, and that was on the property that was um, granted yeah. to the state. Yeah, the, the reason I bring that up is I've reviewed the report uh, by Chatters et al. 2007 in the SHPO database as well as a subsequent one that the BLM authored under Holtzapple et al. And there's quite a change in site density between the two surveys. And so the concern I had was just, there might be a lot more sites than that review indicates. Sure. Um, and in addition, that original survey by Chatters and company, um, they only sampled, uh, I think those uh, sections or parcels rather than a complete survey and the BLM survey was a little bit more intensive. So that, that could also skew the results. So just, just a heads up about that. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, thanks, Sean. Okay, um, next question is gonna be Eric Hartwig and then we'll hear from Linda Fierce. Eric, um, please unmute and go right ahead. Yes, um, my question is pretty simple, I think. Is the comments that have been su submitted in writing, will they go directly to the state land boards or do we need to also submit them to the state land board? The comments that were received will go to the state land board. Okay, thank you. No problem. Sean, you might wanna add, how many comments have we received to date since we opened the comment period? Um, close to 1,800. All of those comments are compiled and will be part of the report that staff sends on to the state land board. Thanks, thanks, Sean. Um, thanks, Sean, and thanks, Eric, for the question. Linda, go right ahead. And then up next in the question line is Connie. Okay, okay. Linda, go ahead. Yeah, um, am I understanding correctly that there is time for another party, another interested party, to submit an application for the purchase of this land. And if that were to occur, do you end up with a competitive bidding process? Sean, I'll kick that one to you. Yeah, I was just gonna. I was just gonna say that that would ultimately um, it would it would make an uh, interesting situation, and I I I think that that would be have to be considered absolutely. Thank you. Okay, Connie, you're up next. Um, I want to note that we're going to do about um, five five more minutes um, of questions here. Um, Connie, go right ahead. Okay, my question is that it seems to me that the weight is on the sale of the land and not on the community's response. I, um, I don't know how to put this, but two other questioners have asked, how do you evaluate the community's response as opposed to the other um, due diligence you've done? And it seems like you're weighing the due diligence 
um, that you've already done and you decided there's no artifacts there, there's no animals that are being um, um, hurt, um, there's no water rights or mineral rights, so the, the project's going to go ahead because the money is being made. And I'm wondering um, what kind of weight our comments have, because it seems like the community does not want um, tax lot 5300 to be sold to this purchaser to be used for housing and whatever they're going to do. That's my question. Okay, well, public comment is an essential part of the due diligence process and all the information that we gather tonight and in writing up until now, and again, during the public comment period that will remain open until March 17th. So public comment is a part of the due diligence process in addition to those other items that you mentioned. Beyond that, I'm not sure exactly what your question is, uh, but perhaps you might bring that up again during uh, the public hearing for comment. Okay. Okay, thank you, Connie. Thank you, John. Um, up next is Jeffrey Kleinman. Um, Jeffrey, please go right ahead. Uh, thank you. And this is directed to both Sean and John. Has there already been an appraisal of the property? Um, that is underway. Uh, it's not completed yet. Who is doing it? Um, you know, I can't recall off the top of my head who that is. Um, we kind of have another person in our agency that deals with all the appraisers and um, I can't remember who it is off the top of my head. When they come up with a number, will that be uh, available in your record uh, for people to pick up? That's something that is, um, it's something that is shared with the, the state land board and is part of our information that we provide to them, yes. Uh, is, will that be accessible to the public at the same time? Um, I'd have to um, look and see where that, if that is something that we can make available, I'm pretty sure that we can, but I have to double check that. It will be part, when, when a, a report is finally uh, put forward to the land board, uh, for one of their meetings and uh, a decision, the appraisal will be part of the public record, Jeffrey. Well, I don't want to take other people's time, but will it be made available to the public as soon as it's complete and delivered to the department? Again, I have to check and see if that's something that, that is possible. Because right, obviously it would be of interest to alternative bidders. That's why I asked. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jeffrey. Okay. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, uh, Sean and John. Okay, um, that's my understanding. We've got somebody who has been unable to raise their hand. Amy Ruff, um, are, you, are you still here? Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay, please go right ahead. Um, when you were talking about the special assessments that you were doing, one of them was about water and there are no water rights on the, the blocks that are up for sale. And so it, there's no, nothing concerned with water about this sale, but um, if water is not sourced from these blocks, can water still be used on these blocks? Um, no, because there's, there's no water rights. Um, for the, for okay. the properties. So, okay, yeah. thanks. That was my question. Perfect. Okay, thanks, Amy. Thanks, you guys. Um, okay, so we've got time for two more questions, and those are going to be from Michael O'Casey and Penn Marangolo. Um, Michael, you are up first. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I'm uh, teaching my boys about some public process, too, at the same time. Um, my, uh, my question is, related to the leasing payments um, right now. So how much is, what are the annual payments for the lease uh, for Central Land and Cattle Company um, on their annual lease payments? I don't have that information at hand as to I, what the details of the lease are. Sean probably doesn't either, but I believe Sir, that that could be provided to you. It's public information. Sean, I don't know if you have that off your hand or not. Yeah, I can tell you. It's the uh, annual lease fee is $28,720. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Sean. No problem. All right. 
Okay, last question, Penn, um, please go right ahead. Hello, this is actually Bob, I'm Penn's partner. Yep. Um, uh, we're just wondering if there's any more clarification that we could get around the structure or precedent that um, public comment is reviewed with. So, you know, maybe comparing to past, past public comment, you know, processes that you guys have received and um, just ways that there, if there is a structure or a precedent that public comment is uh, considered with. Yeah, like, like to follow up on Connie's, I, mean, I think Connie was asking this question and it wasn't really answered. You know, she asked like, how is public comment uh, weighted in this process? And we understand that it's part of the process and that it's part of due diligence that public gets to comment. But what, what weight does that have in the final decision? Um, yeah. Well said. John, do you want to tackle that one? I did, but I was on mute. I said that that is determined by the state land board that weighs all of the things that are studied as part of the due diligence process, including public comment. Obviously, when we do due diligence on a potential property sale or lease, and there is no public comment, it clearly is considered in that way. Uh, extensive public comment, hundreds of public comments, which you've already received, will obviously have more weight when the land board evaluates all the data provided by staff and renders a final decision. Thank you, John. Um, just a quick follow-up, uh, if I can. Is that deliberation process public in any way? Um, is there a report or something that's made? Well, the state land board is tentatively scheduled to meet on this land sale on June 14th. And that is the time when all of the criteria and all of the due diligence data will be compiled and they will then uh, have a deliberative meeting and render a decision. Thank you. So this isn't the last time that there is an opportunity for uh, this to be discussed. Thanks, John. Thanks. Um, thanks for the question. And we are going to talk a little bit more at the end of the meeting about what's next in the process, um, what you all have to look forward to, and how to, to make sure you stay informed. Um, informed. So um, thanks everybody for the very thoughtful questions. I'm going to now ask um, Leanne and Amber to make sure that everybody's hands are lowered. Um, they're gonna do that automatically, I believe, so we can just see all of your, all of the raised hands disappear. Um, the reason that I'm having them do this is because it's time for the public hearing portion of tonight's meeting and raising your hand is also how you'll indicate that you'd like to comment. So again, um, raising hands by, there we go, here come our, here come our commenters, um, by clicking the uh, reactions at the bottom and click the raise hand um, button, or if you're on the phone by pressing star nine. And same thing, I will again call on folks to, to speak in the order that their hands raised. Um, as both John and Sean mentioned, um, public comment is a really important part of the due diligence process. This is how you provide the information you think the state land board should consider in deciding whether school land should be sold. DSL is gonna review all those comments and create a summary that's provided to the land board along with all the comments received. Okay, so as the queue is forming, we're gonna take just a five minute break um, and we'll re return and start the hearing promptly at um, 6.51 p.m. Okay, see you all again in five minutes. All right, everybody, welcome back. Um, we are gonna get started here hearing from you. We have got Quite a few people um, in line to, to provide public comment. Um, so it is quite a few people. Um, it is my hope that we will have time to hear from everybody. Um, but if we do not, um, more people are joining us all the time. And if not everybody gets to speak, remember that tonight is just one of several ways for folks to provide feedback. 
Um, you can submit written feedback through March 17th, and we'll go ahead and put the website information for how to do that in the chat. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, and then I am again going to go over the participation guidelines and the commenting guidelines. I also do wanna reintroduce myself. We've had folks coming and going throughout the meeting. Um, I am Allie Ryan Hansen. I am the communications director for the Oregon Department of State Lands and your moderator tonight. Um, we very much appreciate you all taking the time to be here. We know you have many things that you could be doing with your evening and it means so much to the department, to the process, to the people of Oregon that you've all taken your time to, to come here and listen to us and now um, share information with us. So thank you so very much. Um, reminder, here are our participation guidelines. Um, please do keep your comments to two minutes. Um, a bell will sound when you have 10 seconds left. Leanne, or actually no, it's Amber who's doing that. Amber, will you let us hear the bell? Just a moment. There it is. There's our little bell. Okay, that bell is gonna sound when you've got 10 seconds left. Um, so please, that's about enough time for you to wrap up your final sentence when you hear it. And then I'll also let you know when your time is up. Really, really please do stick to two minutes. Um, that helps more people have a chance to speak. So thank you all in advance for doing that. While we can stop you by muting your mic, I really, really don't want to. Again, I do not love confrontation, but it is my job tonight to help everybody have an opportunity to speak, have us all have a positive experience. And I'm taking that job very seriously. So please, two minutes. Um, also remember, take your hand back down after you've spoken. We will help with that one as well. Okay. It is time to begin. The virtual public comment hearing for the potential direct sale of the Klein Buttes tract is now open. Our first commenter tonight is going to be uh, Tim Benish. You are up first. Um, then following Tim, it's gonna be the Lower Deschutes River. And then after the Lower Deschutes River is Michael O'Casey. Tim, kick us off, kick us off, please. Okay, so thanks. Um, my question or my, my comment is more relevant okay first of all i'm a homeowner or landowner in a, in a within a mile of the adjacent property i own a big big parcel of land that is zoned exclusive farm use and i raise cattle so that's my perspective um I, i'm curious as a follow-on question more it's more of a rhetorical question when the land was bought or acquired in 2007 there was actually some purpose for it it wasn't just because we when when the state of oregon decided to to pick up the land from the federal government. It wasn't just at random. It had to have some specific purpose and it shouldn't have been just because it was gonna generate revenue at some point in time because um, they could have picked up some other land to do that. So if it was valuable in 2007 for the state of Oregon school um, lands program, why now all of a sudden in 2022, is it now no longer valuable to the state lands bureau when they're ready to take and, and sell it at a moment's notice to, or not at a moment's notice, but sell it to an individual rather than retaining it in the school program and, and having it actually value the students um, in future uses and actually actually charge a real market value for the lease of the land instead of some fabricated small amount that some cattle guy is getting for next to nothing to raise his um, cattle and graze on the land. So that's my comment. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, sorry, that's a misnomer. I, mean, I facilitate those meetings, but actually, my name is Mary Fleischman, and I am one of the co leaders of the local chapter of the Great Old Broads for Wilderness, the Bitter Rush Broads. We currently have 156 active members, and we are one of a uh, chapter of 40 across the United States. And in fact, we just went out there today and took a hike. Um, we've been involved, our whole purpose is protection of public lands for over 32 years. <clears throat> we are totally opposed to the Department of State, of State Lands selling 400 acres of public lands um, to the developers of the Thorberg uh, Resort. Um, they should not be allowed to have a free card to purchase this area without other options or individuals or groups 
able to do the same. <clears throat> what our biggest concern is we live in a desert and have had severe drought conditions for the past decades or more. The proposed development of this resort, which has had numerous legal challenges and litigations through the years, uh, they want a to purchase these additional acres for the purpose to develop three, go three golf courses, six artificial lakes, and up to more than a thousand homes, which will most likely be people's second homes. <clears throat> this will mean that there, what I'm understanding is there will be over 6 million gallons of water per day that will be used. While Thor Thornburg says that they have the water situation figured out, this will have a huge impact on the Deschutes Water Aquifer, YQs, and local neighbors with wells who already are experiencing them drying up. Again, with the current concerns we are experiencing with drought conditions, it makes absolutely no sense for the sale to go forward. Again, this Department of Sand Land's mission is to protect state waterways, land legacy, and wetlands. This is not an area at all that should be put up for sale. Um, and our organization will be following up with the governor's office as well as our local county commissioners with our concerns. The sale should not even be on the radar. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Okay, next we'll hear from Michael O'Casey. After that, it'll be Robert Sharp. And then after Robert is going to be Jessica Churn. Michael, please go right ahead. Yeah, thank you for this opportunity for public comment. My name is Michael Casey and I'm the Pacific Northwest field manager for a group called the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. And we're a national nonprofit with a mission to guarantee all Americans quality places to hunt and fish. And, you know, as an avid hunter angler myself, uh, access is obvious, obviously one of the key priorities for having opportunities for these um, places, hunting and fishing here in the state of Oregon. And uh, Central Oregon is one of those places where mule deer are on a huge decline. Um, we've got development going crazy left and right, and it's really out of control. I think the Thornburg Resort is a prime example of that. Um, but right now we have an opportunity to, you know, keep 400 acres of public lands in public hands. And I think that's a really key thing to consider. I know that the state land board has to consider this for um, the opportunities for common school fund, but at the same time, they need to look at opportunities for uh, recreational and scenic values on the landscape and also consider ways that they can continue to make money in other ways. And so um, I think as the state land board moves forward with this and the Department of State Lands, looking at other alternatives um, is really critical for this process. And um, I'll keep it really brief because 283 people is, is a statement enough about the concern on this valuable landscape. But I, I will say that one of the things TRCP has been focusing on over the past several years is migration corridors. And if you look at this, there's this little thin stretch that runs to the north between Eagle Crest and the public lands. Um, and, if, and if that 5,300 is sold off, um, not only will you lose huge recreational access, but you'll lose a really thin migration corridor that's critical um, and something that's being lost every day here in Central Oregon from Mule Deer. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, Robert Sharp, please go ahead, and then Jessica, you'll be up. Uh, thank you. My name is Robert Sharp, and I'm a permanent resident on land adjacent to this sale, uh, in particular tax lot 5300. So I'd start by saying we've seen Deschutes County make the unprecedented decision to allow a destination resort on the very doorstep of an existing destination resort. We now see the Department of State Land is proposing to allow these two resorts to become physically conjoined, closing off wildlife and recreation corridors. The existing development work on the Thornburg Resort has already, <clears throat> excuse me, severely curtailed recreational access to Klein Buttes. Uh, and I would say with no equivalent recreational land within miles. And I do wanna stress equivalent land. Uh, I, my wife and I hike there multiple times a week, and we have seen usage drop severely. The sale of tax lots 5300 would even more savagely cut that access. Uh, and I'd say, again, no equivalent land within miles. Um, as you've heard before, this, this sale would close a critical wildlife corridor. We've heard of golden eagles nesting close by. We see bald eagles hunting on these very lands. So. I do respect the ODSL's mission to fund public schools. So really, I would urge one of three solutions. 
One, allow the sale to, to go ahead but create an enduring legal commitment. The land remains wild, unimproved, unfenced, and open for public recreation. I know from people who are present with the initial discussions with the developer that that was their original intention. We see from their existing planning applications that's now gone by the by. The second option would be for the Department of State Land to exercise their right of in lieu land selection. They can return tax lot 5300 to the BLM and select another 160 acres adjacent to Thornburg and so, you know, create a buffer and maintain a buffer between these two resorts. Uh, thirdly, the ODSL could uh, require that the Thornburg developers who purchase this land donate it for tax lot 5300 to an organization who will retain it, and I stress, as wild, unimproved, unfenced land open for public recreation. Uh, I think this sale is a travesty. I predicted this sale some months, some time ago, and I was laughed at by my uh, neighbors, and it has come about. So I urge the DSL to take one of these three options, and that's me, thank you. All right, um, I'm Jessica Jern. I have lived in Central Oregon for the last five years, four years, five years. Um, and I just recently bought a home in um, Northwest Redmond. I previously was renting in Bend. I also come from Jackson, Wyoming, and that is a travesty what has happened there. No one can afford to live there except for second and home, second home owners who are like millionaires and billionaires. My Jackson has been bought out by millionaires and billionaires. And that's what's unfortunately happening here that this organization wants to, this development wants to have second homes, have artificial lakes, golf courses. I also come from education. I work for Redmond Public Schools. I currently work for the ESD, I'm a home visitor. I go to people's houses. Um, people in Redmond, some are doing well, some are struggling. Um, right now, rent is incredibly hard to pay for if you're not making a decent salary. Um, and then that means that people are going to Madras, going to Prineville. Um, this is in the best interest of our community. This is pandering to the wealthy, pandering to, I don't know who's buying these homes, but I hope it doesn't turn into Jackson because that would be a shame because Central Oregon seems fairly inclusive. Again, I agree with all the other points have come up from um, in both like land use, ranchers, um, and also finally, water we've been in a drought last summer it was 109 degrees who's to say that it's not going to be just as bad this summer we live in a desert and they want to have three golf courses how is this right we need to do the best for our community we're like the normal people in this community the people who mountain bike hike people who just work in redmond because they're so busy they're just trying to make make it thank you thank you jessica um, I just want to do a brief reminder to folks, if you're not speaking, please stay on mute to ensure that we can hear everybody who is speaking. Um, and with that... Um, I, I couldn't hear what you were saying. I'm sorry. What I was saying? Do I yes. need to speak up a little bit, guys? Yeah, sort of yeah. Raise your, raise your hands if I need to speak up a little bit. Okay, perfect. Speak up a little bit. <laughs> Got it. Okay, what I was saying was, please stay muted if you're not speaking so that we can hear everybody. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, we are now um, going to go to our next commenters. Um, first, we'll have Eric Hartwig followed by Ben Gordon. Eric, please go ahead. Yes. Um, it, the due diligence uh, items that were shown by uh, the Department of State Lands, uh, it was an interesting um, number of things that they included, but usually due diligence has a, a much more um, important meaning, and that is that the care that a reasonable person takes to avoid harm to other persons or their property, that is part of due diligence. And that is nowhere in what was said by the Department of State Lands for the due diligence that they are seeking. Um, they had water, they had lots of other things, but not that. Um, so I think that is something that needs to be considered when you're doing your due diligence is to make sure you're, as a reasonable person, you're avoiding harm to other persons and their property. 
uh, I understand that your mo your you know mission is to uh, support public schools, but it's also sound stewardship of land, wetlands, waterways, unclaimed property estates, and common school fund. And all of those need to be part of due diligence along with not causing harm. Uh, the idea that I think uh, Mr. Sharp brought up, I, I, I think you would be setting a precedent that would be really terrible to allow two destination resorts to basically abut each other. Uh, that's never been done in Oregon uh, for destination resorts, but this is being considered. And I think that's something that really is a serious precedent that needs to be avoided. Thank you very much. Looks like I'm, I'm up next. You Good are, evening. go right ahead. I'm Ben Gordon. I'm the executive director of Central Oregon Land Watch. Uh, our mission is to defend and plan for Central Oregon's livable future. Really appreciate the opportunity to comment on the proposed sale of land, 400 acres uh, of public land in the Climb Beat Rex area. Land Watch, first and foremost, vehemently opposes the sale of this public land to Central Landing Cattle. We submit a written comments into the record that address our primary concerns, and we invite DSL and the Land Board to review them and reach out with any questions that arise. But tonight, I want to convey uh, something that I find pretty remarkable, uh, the community sentiment toward this proposed sale of public land. Already, you've heard from a number of folks. I think the, the central themes are people are very concerned about the implications of this sale on our Central Oregon community. About a week ago, uh, we asked our fairly modest membership and readership a simple question. Should DSL sell 400 acres of public land to the developer of the Thornburg Destination Resort? So I've spent about 20 years of my career as a community organizer, and I've never experienced the type of resounding and universal response as the one we received to this question. So I'm here to share with you, uh, and D DSL, you will soon receive this via email, that more than 3,100 local businesses community groups and individuals have weighed in to oppose this sale. Let that sink in, 3,100. And those aren't just individuals, those are groups that have large memberships that have weighed in. Included in this unified community voice are dozens, yes, dozens of farmers and ranchers, other local businesses ranging from restaurants, to bakeries, coffee shops, and breweries, to bike shops, motorized running, hunting, fishing, and equestrian outfits, local marketing and photography firms, law firms to real estate offices, all from here in Central Oregon. Clearly, this question has struck a nerve. Also included, conservation groups and organizations, 1,000 Friends of Oregon, Oregon Wild, League of Women Voters, Oregon Natural Desert Association, the Environmental Center, Oregon Hunters Association, as you heard from Michael earlier, Teddy Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, Friends and Neighbors of Deschutes Canyon, Think Wild, Central Oregon, High Desert Food and Farm Alliance, Central Oregon Runners Club, Ladies All Ride, Central Oregon Equestrian Trails, Wild Heart Nature School, and many others. So as DSL conducts its due diligence and considers whether or not to oblige the request of Central Land and Cattle to sell 400 acres of public land in the Climb Meets Recreation Area to that entity, please consider this unified voice of Central Oregonians who unequivocally oppose this sale. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Okay, up next is Benjamin Ward, followed by John Gilbert. Benjamin, please go right ahead. Hello, my name is Ben Ward. I live north of Bend off of old Ben Redmond Highway. Highway. I'm a field biologist and a student at OSU Cascades and strongly oppose the potential sale of the parcels included in the Klein Buttes tract transaction. Selling the parcels in question to the Central Land and Cattle Company LLC or Thornburg Destination Resort would be a huge loss for our community and state. Uh, according to, the, to Deschutes County, we already have 19 golf courses or resorts which are in operation and has been already mentioned, Eagle Crest Resort is just a few miles up the road. Selling these public lands to the Thornburg, Thornburg Resort uh, project would betray the cultural and ecological values that so many of us in this state and community hold dear. Klein Buttes is an important multi-use area which provides locals and visitors with scenic trails and space to run, mountain bike, ride horses, look for birds, take in the majesty of our region, which includes views of the Cascade Crest and Smith Rock State Park alike. 
It provides important habitat for deer, golden, eagle, golden eagles, meadowlarks, bluebirds, pinion jays, and other mammals and reptiles. In conjunction with the Maston area, Klein Buttes provides valuable landscape connectivity to the Deschutes River. Allowing Central Land and Cattle Company to purchase these parcels would place them one step closer to building a resort which will use an unacceptable amount of water for the express interest of serving the interests of very few, while simultaneously being deleterious for the needs of the public. In our arid region, facing ever lessening snowpack, slower aquifer recharge rate, and expanding population, it is critical that we do not allow private firms to draw down our common pool resources, of which water is especially precious, especially in the ever tightening pressure of climate change. The Klein Buttes area is beloved resource for our community, tourists, and wildlife alike. Selling the parcels to a company which will serve to enrich a select few at the cost of so much, including taxing our most precious, precious resource water is totally unacceptable. I wholeheartedly oppose the state selling these parcels. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Okay, John, you are up next. Please go right ahead. Judy McClurg, you'll be at ne up next after John. Hi, good evening. My name is John Gilbert. Can you hear me? Yeah, I sure can. You can. Okay, great. Thanks. I oppose uh, the development of Thornburg um, on the basis of land use as well as water consumption. Um, the sale of the DSL lands, um, as I understand it, would increase the likelihood that the resort will be developed and may increase the size of the resort. Uh, I oppose it, the resort, from a land use point of view, uh, because it just promotes uh, more sprawl uh, and lower density housing uh, and encroaching on our wild lands. Um, I, I also oppose the uh, project from the basis of water consumption. Um, I think that the farming and rancher, the farmers and ranchers that um, live in the area and have shallower residential wells may see their, their wells dry up at least for a portion of the year. This happened uh, with the farmers and ranchers in the western part of alfalfa after, after Brasada was developed. And those with shallower residential wells um, were not, did not, do not get water uh, 12 months of the year now. So um, some of them have to go out and quote unquote haul water to their homes three uh, months of the year. Um, and that is a direct result of Prasada being developed. So the same may potentially occur with this resort being developed as well. Um, I say all this as a developer in Bend. I develop um, properties in Bend that are undeveloped. And I know that people don't like to see undeveloped land get developed. Um, and I'm not against development, um, but I am against uh, this project. So I would encourage DSL uh, Department of State Lands to uh, trade this land uh, with for other land uh, with the BLM and for this land to just be kept in BLM ownership. Um, and then for the Department of State Lands to trade into property perhaps that the BLM owns that is closer to uh, an urban area BLM doesn't like to own land near cities and DSL excel excels with land uh, that is by cities uh, and is able through the land use process to create more value on that land that's in or next to urban areas and get it brought into urban areas like the Stevens Road Tract and Bend. And could this make more money for the school fund uh, in the long run? I know DSL is a long-term player. It's been set up for a long time. Um, and it has long-term goals, not short-term goals, goals, financial goals, that is. Thank you very much for your consideration. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Judy, go ahead. Um, Kim McCarroll, you'll be up next. Thank you. I'm Judy McClurg of the Oregon Hunters Association, Ben Chapter, which is 500 strong and statewide. We number over 8,100 members. We are opposed to the sale of state lands to the Central Land and Cattle Company, Thornburg Destination Resort. The land in question is considered by our Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to be biological wintering grounds for mule, mule deer and elk, which means this land is extremely important to many species of wildlife and birds, many occupying it year round. Mule deer populations have been in steep decline in Central Oregon over the last two decades and have been the subject of statewide media over the last few years, including High Desert Museum brought it to attention 
of the issue through reports and public forums. In large part, the decline is due to human pressures and loss of wildlife habitat. Consider the points that there's a spillover effect of an additional 400 to 800 acres caused by residents and guests hiking, often with dogs, on the surrounding wild lands, much as Eagle Crest residents already do. Resort, resorts post more of a threat to deer than many realize because resident deer concentrate, especially around ponds at the peak of summer, which creates disease hotspots, where a particularly deadly virus called adenovirus hemorrhagic disease takes hold and spreads to resident and migrating deer. Roadkill along Klein Falls Road will spike with the additional traffic of another 1,000 homes on top of the 500 homes at Eagle Crest. We understand about the nesting eagles and they won't tolerate the loss of habitat. And then all water, all life requires water and ODFW has recently expressed deep concern with a 1,200 acre resort meeting its mitigation requirements, especially with the ever worsening drought conditions. I another 400 acres before ODFW and other state agencies are satisfied there won't be a water problem, would be far worse. Please deny this land sale. Please document the bin chapter of Oregon Hunters Association as parties of interest in these proceedings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Judy. Okay, um, Kim McCarroll, you're up next. Jeff Heilman will be after that. Thank you. My name is Kim McCarroll, and I'm here representing the members of Oregon Equestrian Trails and indeed all of the equestrians who enjoy riding the BLM land in the Klein Buttes area. I've been the liaison between our equestrian group and BLM for 15 years. And during that time, we've worked very closely with BLM and the mountain biking community to create trails that provide the kind of recreational experience in the Klein Buttes area that the public wants while still preserving large swaths of the area for wildlife habitat. Uh, the Klein Buttes area has five non-motorized trailheads. Each one has its own small trail network. Equestrians and mountain biking volunteers built those trails and we maintain them, but we've never been able to complete two of the very important parts of the recreation plan for Klein Buttes. First is that we want to have trails that circumnavigate the Buttes, connecting all of the trailheads into a single integrated trail system. And second, uh, we'd like to have trails that connect the trailheads, especially those on the west side of the buttes, with the buttes themselves, which would allow equestrians, mountain bikers, and hikers to enjoy the panoramic views from the summit. Your 400 acres connect the BLM lands and trailheads on the west side of Fine Buttes with the buttes themselves and the land on the east side. If you sell to Central Land and Cattle Company, the impact is gonna be much greater than just the loss of 400 acres of public land to a private developer. It's gonna mean that hikers, equestrians, and mountain bikers will be forever blocked from the buttes themselves and, are, uh, and will never be able to realize our dream of having one integrated trail system in this area. So please, for the sake of the thousands of people who enjoy recreating here, don't sell this land to Thornburg. Instead, consider exchanging it to, for other BLM lands or allow trails to be built across it so that the dream of what the Klein Buttes Trail Network and recreation area can be, can be realized. Your lands are very strategically important and it would be a rotten shame for them to be off limits to Oregonians. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Okay, Jeff um, Heilman, you are up next. After Jeff, um, we'll have Kate Houston. Jeff, go right ahead. Jeff, you're still muted. Thank you. You think after two years of these meetings, I'd figure that out. Uh, sorry, Zoom meetings, I mean. So I live in Bend, Oregon. I want to make two comments. The first one is really about a request for promoting public participation in this. I think this hearing is a great idea. However, the due diligence information that's developed by DSL wasn't made publicly available prior to this meeting. And as I understand, it may not be publicly available after this as well, except by a public records request, which takes some time and costs some money, and you know, it's, it's still not publicly accessible. So I think if the land board members are serious about wanting public input, and I truly believe that they are, then the relevant due diligence information, the information from this public hearing, the public comment, the answers ought to be made available on the DSL website, um, maybe for at least two weeks before the comment period ends. 
In my professional life, I manage the preparation of environmental impact statements. And in that field where public input is desired and legally required, the standard practice is to put all this type of information on the internet so all the public can review it and comment it uh, in an informed way before decisions are made. My second and last comment is about, um, I mean, there's a lot of things I'd love to say about the resort itself and the lack, uh, it's just not a wise choice, but I'm gonna save that for the Deschutes County hearings because I understand that it is largely outside of the purview of the decision that the land board has to make. And I wanna talk instead about long-term versus short-term value and benefits. So selling this property now would provide an immediate bump for the common school fund and that's tempting, but it would be short-lived. It'd be a one-time thing. And we'd forever, forever lose the future benefits to the school fund and to the public. So as an example, uh, the Jason private property owner, we know they intend to build the destination resort in his land and wants to purchase this DSL, these DSL parcels now to support that resort. However, I think it is very reasonable to predict that should that resort be developed on the adjacent land, and if the DSL property remains as part of the common school fund land, its value would increase significantly over today. It would provide a critical role in access and connectivity for the destination resort, which would significantly increase its value and presumably the lease fees in perpetuity for the school fund. So, um, and that's money that could be raised from this land for the common school fund uh, essentially forever, uh, rather than the one-time sale to the resort owner or the would-be resort developer. In addition, if it's kept in public ownership, the land provides public benefits through ecosystem services, and public re recreation and access that would be available to all of us rather than fenced off for the benefit of a wealthy few. So I ask that the land board members decline this request to purchase this property. I just don't think it's in the long-term interest of the Common School Fund or the public in general. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jeff. Kate, please unmute um, and go ahead after you will hear from Elise Wolf. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. My name is Kate Havstad. Um, tonight, I represent our farm, Kassad Family Farms. We're a 360-acre organic farm. We manage both farmlands and um, grazing grounds, rangeland. We provide hundreds of tons of food to Central Oregon, as well as providing ecological services. Um, I actually just wanted to start my comment by reading back to you all the first two policies that are listed on the website for Department of State Lands. One, pursuant to Article 8, Section 5 of the Oregon Constitution, the State Land Board has a constitutional responsibility to manage all land under its jurisdiction with the, quote, object of obtaining the greatest benefit for the people of this state, consistent with the conservation of this resource under sound techniques of land management. Two, in order to achieve the constitutional mandate described above and to maximize the financial return to the common school fund for trust lands, the department will seek to obtain full fair market value for any land or interests in land sold or exchanged. I think that what needs to be evaluated is um, that these two things, the greatest benefit for the people of this state is not congruent necessarily with financial return to the common school fund. Though I think the two can be mutually um, exist at the same time with the correct type of deal. It's worth mentioning that according to the World Economic Forum, using the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals framework, one of their top concerns globally is the loss of biodiversity. So in this due diligence process, you know, it was mentioned that you're looking at endangered species, both plant and animal, as well as cultural significance, any mineral resources or geothermic um, resources. What wasn't mentioned in that evaluation are key ecosystem health indicators, such as biodiversity. To, it seems like this land sale, the question is like the context of who it is sold to. I believe that there could be a buyer for this land 
through creative impact investment structures that could benefit our Oregon School Fund while putting this land into the hands of someone who has a track record of preserving biodiversity and in fact, increasing biodiversity on public landscapes. The proposed buyer of the Thornburg Resort or Central Cattle Land Company, whatever facade they wanna use, <laughs> we see what they plan to do with development. Just the presence of their golf courses threatens the biodiversity of the entire ecosystems of that region. You know why a golf course doesn't have any weeds? It's because of the application of herbicides. The runoff from all of those herbicides from those golf courses is going to pollute and kill the microbiology in the soils and enter our water tables and our aquifers. We know what this developer will do with the land. It's what he's doing with everything else around it. I believe that there's a way to provide economic prosperity for the common school fund through creative impact investment structures to purchase this land and put it into some sort of a common land trust to preserve this public land for our children's futures. Thank you so much for the time. I just had one last point. Uh, once the sale of this is completed, I was reading on the website that it is out of the state's hands. So as far as putting any sort of like conditions on the use of the land, it seems like that is like legally not at all possible. So that shouldn't even be on the table once it's sold, it's out of the state's hands. Um, yeah, that's my, um, I'm firmly, firmly against this. I think for the future of our children, we need to preserve these public lands and put in them into creative structures that are gonna preserve the biodiversity. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Elise Wolf, you are up now. Um, Anthony Broadman, you are going to be up next. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, let me get my notes. My name is Elise Wolf. I direct the uh, uh, organization called Native Bird Care. We are a wildlife rescue specializing in wild birds. We've been here in Central Oregon for 13 years. And I'm going to speak up against the Thornburg um, development, just like everyone else seemingly here. Uh, but I want to just say a few more things here. Uh, there's been some great comments already, but um, in terms of wildlife, we should also think of this area as uh, a very important place for the native flora that happens to be there. I know Juniper gets a lot of criticism, but we had over 60 to 80,000 robins specifically in this area this winter. Uh, gorging on the juniper berries. Could you please turn off your mic, whoever has that on, please? Um, so this development cuts directly into the heart of this wild area, which is not replaceable anywhere around here. It is bordered by two rivers. It's a major migratory route for our mule deer. Uh, it is also a particularly wild, given that it's surrounded by roads and there is little uh, other alternatives for, for wildlife there. Essentially the development, which clearly goes straight up into the canyon and actually looks like the DSL specifically offered those uh, particular lots in order to give the Thornburg Resort a canyon lands rather than some of the uh, other areas. So that's questionable to me. But essentially we're eviscerating this entire area and the impacts that will be seen will not be limited to the resort, but in fact, uh, wind up um, moving out into the entire area. One of the things that will happen when you put res a big resort right through the heart of this thing is there will be a fundamental change in the avian population that will occur as homeowners attract different species through feeders, grass and ponds and displace the resident species of birds. This is happening across central Oregon, um, but that loss will be noticeable. Um, regarding resorts, not only do the massive number of plate glass windows kill thousands of birds each year, but the water usage, the pesticides and the chemicals and the introduction, introduction of non-native plant species will permanently change and harm the area. Additionally, any more exhaustion of our uh, aquifer will hurt all of our wildlife and the people who live nearby. So in sum, I don't agree with this um, 
development. I think it is specifically benefits um, the wealthy and it removes uh, an enormous, beautiful, wild space um, between Redmond, Bend and Sisters. And in the end, once that development goes in there, the rest of that BLM will probably get sold and someday that entire area will just be one house after another. And we can kiss the migratory path of the mule deer goodbye. And we won't be seeing 80,000 robins again. Thank you. Thank you, Elise. Anthony, you are up now. Seth Eisenberg, you'll be next. Good evening, Anthony Broadman. Um, I'm appearing in my individual capacity, not on behalf of the Ben City Council where I serve as a city councilor. I am a proud public landowner. Um, and I think we need to remember the context of where this land sits. It's close to some of the fastest growing urban areas in the state and the entire Klein complex, like many of our, our wilder places in this region is a critical public safety valve for the people of Bend and all of Central Oregon. So this sale shouldn't be considered if we are serious about our stewardship of land and water in this region. Um, generations to come will look back at this moment in Oregon's land use history, at the decisions we're making um, now and in, in rooms um, all across our state um, and ask whether we, we've upheld Oregon's land use system and honored the land. So I would ask that you please consider what we need as a region instead of what uh, a very few want. And growth for the sake of growth is um, the ideology of a cancer cell. I'm reminded by a quote from Edward Abbey. So I encourage you to do right by the land and um, the people of Central Oregon. I appreciate this opportunity to offer public comment. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Seth, please go ahead. Calvin Chang, you'll be up next. Thank you. <clears throat> so the Department of State Lands appears to have a significant mission uh, as part of it to generate maximum revenue for the Common School Fund. However, as others have noted, this is only one of the tasks that <clears throat> the Department of State Lands is tasked with, including protecting waterways and wetlands. Um, and I think the overall mission is somewhat more nuanced as well. Um, by my estimates, um, and this has been the the leg that the developer has stood upon relative to the rationale for the development of the resort. Again, I know that you're not approving that, but I do think that the integration of this parcel into that needs to be taken into consideration. Is really about, well, if it's not sold, it's going to be taking money away from the Common School Fund and school children. I think that's a rather emotional response. I'd like to point out some statistics. So based on the $60 million contrib contribution last year, um, by the DSL to the Common School Fund into the budget for education, which was 2.089 billion. Um, if we double that for the, if that was for the biennium, if we double the contribution to 120 million over the two years, that's approximately 5% of that overall budget. And that is for all DSL contributions across all parcels, um, both for leases and for sales in, those, in that period. So, and it is not allocated, I think it's very important to see back directly into Deschutes County. It goes into the general fund and then it's allocated out. So one of the things that uh, I wanted to point out was firstly that, and then the, in, in terms of the sale of the land, I guess I would, I would actually also request that in particular relative to thinking about the valuation of it, that the DSL would hold off on the sale pending approval if that happened for the troubled Thornburg development. Um, as some others have pointed out, this has been a very important corridor for wildlife. And if this is conjoined essentially with the development at um, Eagle Crest, that, you know, that's going to cut that off. I think, you know, most important that we're not emotional in this evaluation. Um, there are <clears throat> no equivalent public land, particularly regarding views uh, from the Klein Buttes in the immediate area. And um, I think the, the rationale that Robert Sharp laid out in prior testimony, uh, I won't reiterate that, but I strongly reiterate the three options that he laid out. 
And while this is not a wetland or a waterway, um, the Kleinview's parcel should be considered as part of the water legacy for Central Oregon, especially in an era of severe drought and ongoing climate change. We don't really know what's going to come. And I think that this portion, even though this parcel doesn't have essentially water rights associated with it, it does seem to be part of this bigger picture relative to the massive water consumption tied to this development. And I think we'll be complicit essentially in a very, very difficult decision in the current climate crisis that we're looking at relative to water in Central Oregon. I strongly oppose the sale of this parcel. And, and last, I would say that um, trading this land with BLM, as mentioned by others, including John Gilbert, would be another viable option to explore. And um, I hope that you will take these my, my testimony and that of others into consideration and your deliberations on what to do in, in dealing with this parcel. And I appreciate the opportunity to testify tonight. Thank you very much, Seth. Kelvin, please go ahead. Um, thank you. Number one, um, I want to say that I strongly oppose the sale of the parcel. Uh, many folks on this forum have articulated the detriment to public good and public benefit um, and to the environment, and I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to be a little bit more selfish. I live just south of the proposed uh, land sale, and uh, we don't need another three golf courses consuming uh, all of this water. Um, six million gallons, up to six million gallons a day is just not sustainable. We are on well water. And what I want to ask is Sean Zumwalt and John Swanson, Will you be paying for my well when that when 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 I need to dig a, a, a deeper well for my um, daily living and and uh, what I'm going to be able to do um, on a day to day basis? So uh, yes, I mountain bike, I hike, and I enjoy the public and natural uh, resources that we have around here, and all the things that uh, have been said uh, about um, the public good. Um, but I'm just, I'm just going to be a little bit selfish here. Um, I just live a bit south, and what am I going to do? That's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Kelvin. Um, I just want to take a sec to note that we, are, we have about an hour left um, in the meeting tonight. We've got 26 folks remaining who want to give testimony. You all are doing very well at sticking to your two minutes. Um, staying muted when you're not talking and just being super respectful of all of the other speakers. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, Allie, Hertz, Allie Hartz, you are up next. We'll then go to Joe Craig. Allie, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm a Central Oregon resident and I've been living here for 13 years. I've lived in Prineville, Terrebonne, Redmond and Bend. I'm a rock climber, mountain biker, skier and trail runner. I moved to Central Oregon in 2009 for the quality of life and expansive open space of the high desert and the incredible views from just about anywhere in our region. During the fall, winter, and spring, trail runners migrate to the desert to get in their miles, places like Horse Ridge, the Badlands, Smith Rock, and Klein Buttes. These trails tend to stay clear and dry of snow, um, and they tend to be a little bit warmer and sunnier. It's also breathtakingly beautiful out there, as many of you know and have already mentioned. Um, these trails, especially Klein Buttes, offer hills and mountain training that we runners can't get in town during the winter, and access to these trails is paramount for those of us who are training year-round for mountain and ultra objectives. It's also a quiet, usually uncrowded place for us to take our dogs to run off leash, and it's an incredible resource for the running community. Over the past 13 years, I've observed the glaciers in the Three Sisters Wilderness recede at an alarming rate that's obvious to anyone who's paying attention. I followed reports on threats to our rivers and the salmon on which so many in the Pacific Northwest depend. I've watched our lakes and reservoirs diminish or become unsafe during the summer due to algae blooms. And I've witnessed protests over water rights and I know we're in a state of drought while our current snowpack is below average. Yet I also continue to watch development on our desert landscapes. I notice manicured green lawns fed by giant irrigation sprinklers through the hottest summer days. I know our region's growth is inevitable, and yet I worry about the impacts to our beloved natural surroundings if we're not careful and thoughtful about how we grow our communities in Central Oregon. It is for all these reasons that I urge DSL to reject this sale. 
not only would this take an incredible resource from our local running and hiking community, it would place unimaginable pressure on our already limited water resources. Um, thank you, I heard the buzz, so I'll end there. Thank you, Allie. Okay, um, Joe Craig, it's your turn. Janet Skeck, she will be up next. Okay, I wanna ditto everything Allie said, except I am not nearly the athlete that she is. I am an outdoorsman and a conservationist, and I oppose the sale. Central Oregon is populated with many outdoor lovers and conservationists, and as stated by Ben Gordon of the Central Oregon Land Watch, there are thousands of us. So I do hope that the state takes into consideration the public opinion when they make their decision. Central Oregon has limited water supply, and our current drought has exemplified this situation. In 2005, there wasn't the concern for the, about the drought as there is now. Uh, and I know this is not about the Thornburg Resort particularly, but we cannot enable this resort. The state of Oregon does not need to sell or lease land to a company that wants to build a resort for the affluent. That's been said over and over. We need to protect this land. We need to think about the migratory habits of not only the mule deer, but as the robins were mentioned earlier, in, in all wildlife, they're all here with us and we need a balance of nature. Uh, Klein Buttes provides access to recreational opportunities and, and a scenic value for a suite of vibrant communities, including hikers, bikers, runners, equestrians, bird watchers, et cetera, as mentioned. And again, I just wanna make the point, it's been 17 years from 2005 to now, and a lot has happened when it comes to water rights. I thank you for having this open forum. And uh, I think the best thing right now is to give the land back to the Bureau of Land Management, let them manage it and exchange it for another piece of property. I do think the schools need money, obviously, but this is not the best way. This may be the easy button right now, but it's not the best for our future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Janet, you are up. Jeffrey Kleiman, you're going to be next. Hi, can you hear me? We sure can. Sorry. <laughs> okay, great. great. Uh, I have um, a slightly different uh, look, uh, but I do incorporate a number of the comments from previous speakers. Uh, I look at parcel 5300 in particular. I consider it a migration corridor, a public lands access to the west side of Klein Buttes. I look at what I am a little concerned about is the possibility of setting a precedent where two private resort communities are joined creating approximately just under 5,000 acres of inaccessible to the public lands, if you want to consider it that way. Um, previous speakers have spoken to the wild, unimproved, undeveloped corridor as being helpful for the larger uh, population of this area, which I consider 200,000 people or more, without knowing what the population of our schools are, I am not at all adverse to DSL sales of land, but I wonder if there are ways to consider at least 160 acres of this proposed sale, which is, I consider parcel 5,300. If there aren't some even more monetarily um, helpful uh, solutions to for DSL to consider. Uh, I, I believe we've heard from two to five different community, if you will, groups uh, who along with perhaps Eagle Crest residents might consider leasing this parcel 5300 at a much higher rate than the current lease if I've done my math right, um, that's about $11,200 per year. I wonder if a group of us couldn't at least propose a leasing contract for that one parcel 
that would not only guarantee a longer term income for the public schools, but also maintain the public and wildlife corridor that I think are very, very unique um, and, and very appropriate uh, to preserve. Thank you very much for the public hearing and I appreciate my chance to be heard. Thank you very much, Janet. Jeffrey, you are up. Denise, Denise Vastola, you will be next. Thank you, Allie. Uh, I represent Nunzi Gould and I submitted a letter earlier this evening uh, in it, I butchered Sean's name, so I'll file a corrected copy when the hearing is over. But in any event, uh, I wanna just hit a few high points in the letter. I think all the folks who've testified have made great and very pertinent points. But number one, under the statutes that govern uh, the division and the board, the department and the board, it is not permissible to sell state lands to anyone other than an individual person. And Central Land is a mm. limited liability company. It is not wow. an individual. So the state would be exceeding its jurisdiction in attempting to carry out this sale. Um, I would also point out that the obligation to maximize the financial return for the Common School Fund only arises in the event of a sale itself. It does not compel a sale. The statutes instead require, whether it's a sale or a lease, uh, to give consideration to the protection and conservation of natural resources, including scenic and recreational ones, uh, conserving public health and recreational enjoyment, and conserving plant, aquatic, and animal life. So there's really been a misunderstanding of what's required here. Uh, when the lease was entered into, the existing lease was entered in, into in 2005 and amended since, but it still requires um, that um, all of the land uh, be maintained as open space except for the road itself. And it contains detailed requirements for conserving the scenic resources, conservation of soils, etc. cetera. Uh, so, what happened in 2005 was that the DSL folks at the time had a clear understanding of what they had to do and what their obligations were. And this lease runs through uh, December 31st of 2031. Uh, if you sell the property, you are unloading this obligation to maintain open space for the benefit of the developer. And that is really impermissible. The last point I would make is asking the folks at DSL who have been directly involved in this to consider the impression you're making and uh, the impression you're leaving uh, with the public. Uh, for example, when you look at the lease requirement of paying a mere $28,000 a year and you go through the, the DSL file on this, year after year, the department has agreed to forego payment or defer payment of the rent. Now, how is that maximizing returns for the common school fund? It creates the appearance that the department is working hand in hand with the developer. And so too does this prospective sale. Um, so the sale is without merit and it would not be lawful to carry it out. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Um, Denise, it is your turn. Tia Hatton, you'll be up next. Hi, thank you. Um, I am opposed to the entire 400 acre sale to Central Land and Cattle Company. And I strongly oppose uh, to the lot 5300 that touches Eagle Crest property line. No other resort in Central Oregon butts up to another resort. This sets a new precedent for greedy developers to capitalize on. The whole concept of living in this community, and when I'm talking about this community, I'm talking about uh, Eagle Crest, is because of open spaces and recreation areas 
and wildlife corridors that are currently shared with the public. Do not sell this land to a greedy developer that already owns more than 2,000 acres of land. That already makes it the largest resort in Central Oregon. Water is a huge issue for the farmers due to the years of long drought. And I know water is not on the table at the moment, but that has to be considered. Do not sell this land. It should remain a public recreation area and wildlife area. These 400 acres should remain public lands. Thank you for considering public comments as an important part of your due diligence process. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Tia, it is your turn. The next person on the list is simply called iPad. I am hoping that you see yourself and you know who you are, iPad. Tia, go ahead. All right, thanks, Ali. Um, and thanks for accepting comments here tonight. Um, good evening, my name is Tia Hatton. I was born and raised here in Bend, Oregon, and my family moved here in the 1960s. I'm here watching the hearing tonight with both my parents who have been realtors in Central Oregon for 25 years. Um, we're all firmly opposed to this proposed sale. Um, it was the beauty of Oregon's high desert that originally brought my grandparents out here and drove my grandfather to write multiple books on the geography and climate of Central Oregon and Oregon. We really enjoy recreating out in that area, running, biking, walking, and uh, enjoying time as a family. Um, I'm also here tonight in my professional capacity as the Central Oregon organizer for the Oregon League of Conservation Voters, which in part fights to protect Oregon's natural legacy. Our local members and volunteers, as well as myself and my family, as I mentioned, are opposed to this project. As you likely know, Deschutes County is the fastest growing county in Oregon, while our tourism industry is doing fine. Um, what is starting to get more and more crowded are our public lands. Um, and the proposed area of sale is in and around a popular area that provides tremendous scenic and recreational value for diverse communities throughout Central Oregon. If the Department of State Lands object is to obtain the greatest benefit for the people of this state, then I really do believe that that's maintaining it in public ownership. Um, I found that the Common School Fund can pit funding for our schools against deciding what's best for the local public um, and I did want to share about a recent bill that my organization OLCB championed in Oregon short legislative session, which was the Elliott State Research Forest Bill, um, which supported decoupling the Elliott State Forest from the Common School Fund. Um, due to the amount of support out here tonight and those signed in opposition, I hope that you all will consider alternatives. Um, in conclusion, I agree with the others who have spoken out tonight against this project and believe the greatest public benefit is to maintain this as public land. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tia. iPad, we can, if you're not sure if it's you, we can invite you. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. You'll see a, something perfect. Okay, iPad, go ahead. Please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Susan Hart and I live just south of the, uh, of the resorts, just off of Klein Falls Road. Been uh, involved with the, with the hearings regarding that. Uh, resort for many, many years. I own a small acreage and uh, I've lived here for 36 years after having grown up near the Jackson area, which Wyoming, which we heard from another speaker earlier as to what has happened to that area. Um, I strongly oppose this sale and I have some concerns about the transparency of all of this. Uh, it is my understanding that BLM cannot sell directly to a uh, private individual. And I wondered if uh, the uh, Central Land and Cattle Company started this process with BLM and the loophole was to sell to DSL and then DSL could sell to them. So I, I think as part of the due diligence and uh, in uh, and for transparency's sake, uh, this should be disclosed when, when uh, Central Land Cattle began their inquiry about buying this property. Secondly, 
if the mission is to fund schools, uh, why, why this property, why did DSL buy this property instead of other property? And secondly, exactly how will the funds from this sale benefit schools and will they benefit Central Oregon schools? Or as someone mentioned, it may just go into a general fund where it will not benefit the local schools. And I'd like to see a, as part of the due diligence, an actual breakdown of the funds and how they would be spent and where they would go. And along with that, if it is their mission to um, provide benefit for the schools, the most benefit, where is the disclosure on all other alternatives and what kind of money that would produce in the long term? Because uh, you know, we should know what all of the options are, not just one option that benefits one party. Um, then uh, of some other people have mentioned, part of due diligence should also include effect on biodiversity, effect on carbon, uh, on climate change, carbon impact. Uh, my water is getting reduced to one week every three weeks. Uh, for my irrigation water. How am I going to uh, irrigate my land and keep my livestock and, and uh, plants growing under those kinds of conditions? And I know that's not part of what the DSL concerns with, but as other people have mentioned, um, if this is gonna be part of a resort, they do have the requirement uh, to mitigate water usage. And they do that by buying somebody else's water and uh, saying that they're mitigating it and returning it to the river, which isn't exactly how it works out, especially when there's a drought. Um, so uh, again, I am a, a strongly opposed to this sale and would suggest that, uh, that DSL be more transparent and do a better uh, and more, more comprehensive due diligence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, up next is Beth Jacoby. Uh, after Beth will be Ellie Gage. Beth, please go ahead. Uh, hello, I'm Beth Jacoby. I uh, live in Tumalo. Um, I just want to take make a note that everyone who has spoken tonight has been opposed to this sale, and people have made incredible um, points. Um, I am also opposed to this sale. You know, we are facing a water crisis, a climate crisis, a housing crisis. Um, and I think the sale of this land will help to um, give a momentum to the Thornburg Resort. Um, you know, golf courses, uh, man-made lake, hundreds and hundreds of uh, resort homes are, are really the last thing we need. Um, just a few days ago, the state of Oregon declared a state of, of emergency for Klamath County due to drought. Um, we are experiencing a similar um, pattern. Um, it, it, um, yeah, it, it makes no sense that um, with all of these challenges with, um, that, that this would be how the state is trying to serve and benefit uh, the people of Oregon. Uh, it seems like it will benefit um, a very few particular affluent um, people and, and not benefit uh, the public good. Um, and I, yeah, support other people's ideas of um, maybe exchanging the land uh, with the BLM or, you know, exploring other avenues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beth. Ellie, you are up. Please unmute and go ahead. Um, we'll hear from Ivan next. Hi, my name is Ellie Gage. I've lived in Central Oregon for 22 years. I am absolutely opposed to the sale of state lands to the developer of Thornburg Resorts. I support livestock grazing. I support hunting. I support public lands and I support land stewardship, but I don't support this sale. This development will disproportionately benefit a small group of individuals. We already have 19 golf courses in Deschutes County. I think we can live without golf, but I know we can't live without water. 
I believe there are better solutions to funding public schools than the sale of this land. That seems like a short-term fix. For education in Oregon, I'd be more in favor of overhauling the current uh, funding to public schools to become more equitable. I'm concerned about habitat fragmentation for wildlife, and I have uh, extreme concerns for the water situation in the high desert. Um, this is just natural resource extraction as far as I'm concerned. It's not natural resource stewardship. I think in 2022, we can do better to sustainably manage our natural resources. Thank you. Ellie, thank you very much. Ivan, please go ahead. Um, David Scott, you'll be up next. Hello, my name is Ivan Mamatif and I study agronomy and natural resources with OSU. I would like to make some points. Um, the data that's used in the due diligence for water, you know, land use and, and stuff like that are pretty old. Going back as far as 2004, we have studies in 2017 from USGS and the NRCS that state that 70% of our annual precipitation is our surface water and that it is also 90% diversion. The same studies also found that a commercial well six and a half miles off of Wychus Creek when turned on adjusts the flow rate in the stream. So I ask how it is a sound technique of con conservation to use outdated studies in such a unique environment. There is no ecosystem or aquifer like the Deschutes Basin that exists anywhere else in the world. There should be no consideration of doing this when the state over allocated 230,000 acre feet since the beginning. So you have senior water rights being sold to companies like <clears throat> Thornbur. So with the sale of this 400 acres, it would allow them to purchase more water than they're already allowed. They have 2,169 acre feet of water. If you sell them another 400 acres of land, they can then also buy more water from these irrigation districts. While these irrigation districts are taking aerial footage of the farmland and taking the water rights from these farmers while they're not getting enough water to water it in the first place. I see a extreme level of corruption and that there is no separation. People should be looking at our natural resources as a more important economic impact than another resort that offers nothing unique. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, David Scott. Please go ahead. Um, up next will be up next will be Paul Lipscomb. Um, after Paul, we're going to go to Paula Latassa. Okay, David, go ahead. Thank you, there. Um, thank thank you to everybody who's spoken on probably more eloquently than I will be before. Um, I'm a retired doctor. I've lived here since 2013. Um, I'm reminded that uh, the motto in medicine is uh, first of all, do no harm. Uh, I see this as a very harmful addition uh, to an already bad project. Uh, selling the 400 acres, I think, is doubling down on an, alre on an already very bad idea. And I'm, I'm thinking pr primarily about the water issue. I think in the face of a 1,200 year drought that we're, be we're being told we're in the, the jaws of, the idea of creating a mega resort that essentially allows the, mer the merging of two giant resorts into one, uh, that will have six golf courses within about a one mile diameter, uh, water features, thousands of homes. And this is happening when wells are already being redrilled. Rancher water access, as we've been told earlier, is being rationed. Uh, is outrageous, basically. Uh, and the fact that we even got to the stage where, where we're discussing it is mind boggling. Uh, when the wells run dry, when uh, homes and the ranches that are here already become worthless, who will be liable and what will we do then to correct the damages which we are considering doing right now? I think we will look back on this if it's approved as a historically bad decision. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, Paul Lipscomb, go ahead. We'll hear then from Paula. Yes, and what I would like to say is this, it's pretty simple, Sean Zumwalt, testified that the rental value for this property was $28,000 a year. What he neglected to say is that 
that $28,000 a year had been deferred and wasn't being paid. I think that's dishonest. Thank you, Paul. Paula, please go ahead. Um, after that will be James D. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I feel humble following so many eloquent speakers with prepared points. Tonight, I don't have prepared points. I am an ecological consultant, been living here in Central Oregon for 30 years, have worked on natural resources, resource issues in the area. I'm an avid outdoors person. I have fought the Thornburg Resort since 2005 when it first came on my purview. Um, the reasons I've opposed it, and I know that's not what we're here to talk about, but the reasons I've opposed it is because my child, I live in Tumalo. My children went to Tumalo Community School. I knew not only as an ecologist, but as a parent, this was bad for our community. That, that this is a destination resort. They would not be paying taxes that go into SDCs that develop schools. That gets back to the point of where your decision-making seems to be pointed at, which is benefiting schools. If we're to truly benefit schools, we need to quit relying on antiquated systems of funding. And we need to look at not what was established in, I believe it was stated 1897 or 1857, but we need to look at what the real needs are today. And if we are to teach our children anything, we need to teach them the value of biodiversity, as was mentioned, the value of producing food and not just going to a grocery store and buying some processed box of poison. We need to focus on our water and being able to supply our children with drinking water. These are the values that are important to our children. Their schools are irrelevant if we cannot provide clean water, clean air, and good food to eat. So I ditto pretty much everything that has been said tonight. There are a few things that just weren't relevant to me, um, specifically, I don't have a well growing, going dry, but um, so to that man who said he was selfish, that's not true. You're stating something for a lot of people and you're standing up for other people that weren't able to speak tonight. So please remember, we need to protect our water. We need to teach our children these important values. Education is not just in the classroom. Parents educate their children every day and it has been never more apparent than during this time of COVID. I couldn't imagine having to raise children with um, no school and no place to take them to recreate. These are all very important things that don't happen in the classroom. We need to teach our children values outside the classroom. And um, I can't remember who it was that said it, but if it's only 5% of the school funds, come on. <laughs> We can find better ways to fund our schools than antiquated systems. Thank you for the time to speak. Thanks very much, Paula. Uh, James D, you are up now. Uh, good evening. Um, I definitely have a sort of a different take on this. Uh, DSL has already created a new precedent. Uh, when they did a land transfer for the east side of <coughs> Stevens tract. When they did that, they uh, took control of how the land was going to be developed. They <coughs> mandated uh, uh, titles, or excuse me, um, <coughs> I apologize. Uh, essentially, the land is deed restricted for teachers and educators. If this land is to be sold and it is to be sold to essentially a private developer, DSL and the state of Oregon now has already said that they do have a say in what happens to it. So beyond all the environmental issues, which I do not discount, uh, I just have to say that DSL now has basically said how the land is gonna be developed 
and how it's going to be developed following Oregon state land use laws. So every single sale from now on by DSL should follow those laws. They should be high density if they do occur and the sale does happen and deed restrictions should and can be applied so that affordable housing can occur across Central Oregon and water management and climate friendly laws and usages can be invoked, including the currently discussed executive order by the governor uh, 2004. Um, this is the new precedent. I understand all the environmental concerns. I don't discount them in any way. But ultimately, if DSL is going to sell land at fair market value, fair market value on the east side of Bend is millions and millions and millions of dollars for 400 acres. That's the reality. That is what DSL approved last year. If the new development is only going to provide a pittance of that, then that is not fair market value. That is not providing housing. That is not supporting the school systems. And that is not how the trust of lands for investment should occur. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, James. I'm just going to do a quick, quick process check. And um, we've got about 15 minutes left. We've got 21 people left to speak. We are going to do our very best to get to everybody. I would just ask everyone, um, you know, to be as to the point as you possibly can um, in the interest of hearing from as many people as we possibly can this evening, while keeping in mind that there are lots of other ways to submit written comment. Um, the public comment period um, is not yet over and won't be over to the 17th. But that, Jay- and Quit talking so much. Okay, thank you, Evan. Okay, Jay, um, you go right ahead. And Hi, then we're going to hear from the 360 phone number. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank the, everybody for your comments tonight. Uh, I'm a professor, a local business owner, and avid outdoor enthusiast. I'm opposed to the sale of this plot of land to Thornburg Resort. Tonight, my 13-year-old daughter asked me why I'm showing up for my community. When I told her a private resort wanted to use 6 million, million gallons of water a day for fake lakes and three golf courses, she laughed and said, Dad, we don't have water for that. Now, I think my daughter's pretty smart, but it doesn't take an expert to see that Thornburg's water rights were approved based upon 2008 numbers. That was a long time ago. Our population's booming. The effects of climate change in our community are real. If you don't think my daughter's perspective is accurate, I'd like to read the following out of an article from the source for public record. However, a letter from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services from January 2nd argued the conditions have changed since the site's final master plan was approved in 2008. And I quote, in 2008, when they came up with, what they came up with made sense, but that was also a very long time ago, and conditions in the basin have continued to degrade since then. Danette Fosera, Water Policy Coordinator for U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Services. While I realize tonight's discussion is not about water rights, it's a simple reality that more land equals more use of resources. Since CSL must take the public's best interest at heart, there's no way that the sale of this land to a private entity can achieve sustainability. If it's pushed back to develop from the developer for my comments and the comments of others, it's a really simple solution. The developer can simply show us their current water mitigation plan and make it 100% publicly accessible and submit it for independent government review. The rose colored glasses in this community need to come off. We need the DSL to take an honest look at our community impact alongside its citizens who've spoken up tonight. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Jay. Up next is the um, 360-772 phone number. I'm going to ask you to, oh, that's not gonna work because you're on the phone. Oh, you're unmuted. Can you hear can me? You, yep, we can hear you, go right ahead. All right, my name is Alicia Meadows. I'm from Vancouver, Washington. Um, me and my family, we come down there to go off-roading in the area and we also like to go hiking and you know, camp at the little campgrounds there. Um, if this area was to be sold, my kids wouldn't be able to enjoy that, um, as well as other people in that area. And we drive like three hours with our truck and trailer to come down there and enjoy this area. 
So like everybody else, I'm opposed to this. Thank you very much. Okay, up next we'll hear from Carl Nolte. Carl will be followed by Ken Brown. Carl, go ahead. Yeah, hello. My name is Carl Nolte. I'm uh, probably to some people, I'm a development engineer. I've been doing land development for the last 45 years. I was list, I've been listening to this and I found that uh, Jeffrey Kleinman asked some very good questions that the land board didn't have answers for. And that deals with the appraisal. Well, my wife is a horse person and likes riding out in that area. The questions I have is that the appraisal hasn't been done yet. We're sitting here talking and the appraisal hadn't been done. The, qu the other question is, is what were the conditions of the appraisal? Were they conditioned on development or non-development? These issues make significant differences is I've been doing this for 45 years. I've uh, dealt with all of these issues. Mr. Klein asked the right questions that the members of the, uh, the board members didn't know, I find appalling. Because if I walked into a meeting and somebody asked, one of the uh, members asked me if I had a answer to what the appraisal question is, and I didn't, I would be embarrassed. So, Allie, before anything goes forward, and you're saying that this is going to go forward on June 14th, we need to know how the appraisal was, is being done, who is doing it. Is it being done by a central Oregon firm, or is it being done by a Valley firm? Two different things. I found two different values in my experience from dealing with Valley firms versus Central Oregon. And they are quite different. So that is, uh, it's a question I had earlier. I think it should be answered before you move forward. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Carl. Ken, please go ahead. Um, David Buckley, you'll be up next. Hi, my name is Ken Brown. I'm a, I'm a paralegal. I'm actually temporarily living in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for uh, working on a case. Um, but honestly, since being out here, I can hardly think of anything else but being back uh, in Central Oregon where I grew up. Um, and that's mainly because when I walk outside of my house here, all I see is building after building after building after building. And it's miles and miles away from any sort of nature of any kind. I, um, I grew up in Tumalo. I, uh, I, live, I went to Tumalo Community. Um, I was a Tumalo Tiger. And then I was a, a Lava Bear at Bend High School. Um, and I, I love my school systems there. And I think that improving our school system is an incredible thing to aspire to. Um, but honestly, when I think about growing up in, in Central Oregon, I, I think about the schooling, but I also think about the time I spent, especially in Tumalo, walking in my backyard. In fact, I mean, you can't see it, but I, I just realized when I was trying to prepare what I was going to say, but I have a horseshoe. I have a horseshoe that I take with me that I found when I would wander around in uh, the sagebrush ridden <laughs> you know, high desert of, of Oregon. And anytime I hear about stuff like this, also shout out to um, Central Oregon um, Land Watch, who spoke earlier, uh, who notified me about this. But um, anytime I hear stuff about this, it just breaks my heart because I feel like a fundamental piece of me growing up and any child growing up is being able to experience nature, especially the unbelievable beauty of Central Oregon's raw, untouched nature. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't have any cool statistics. I, I really appreciate everyone's planned statements and all that, but um, I get emotional about this. This land, all of this land means an immense amount. We can't turn this back 
into the the way it is. Once we put a golf course on it, you know, I mean, it, it's it's heartbreaking. Um, so that's how I feel about that. I appreciate being able to speak. Um, that's all I got. Thanks so much, Ken. David Buckley, go right ahead. We'll hear from Shayla Scott next. Okay, um, I'm a recent arrival to this area. It's spectacular. It's high desert. Um, you know, one of the things I would address is, okay, we're on Zoom. The COVID goes away on Saturday, right? We should have something at the Deschutes County Fairgrounds, you know, this metric of weighing. I mean, there's personal anecdotes to the love of the nature and the water. I get all that. It's relevant. But in the arcane administrative law and what's been rightly pointed out by some very knowledgeable individuals, as far as the uh, DSL and the metrics or the uh, mechanism by which they can sell lands for the school and the kids, I get that. But to me, this boils down to resources and urbanization. So water, you know, this is kind of like a boomer thing, this golf and sitting on your back porch and you've got a great green. And so last summer, the heat was incredible. And I was trying to keep just the trees and my lawn green. So I wonder as far as the hydrology and the demand, it's like, oh, so if we get these consistent climate um, heat waves that basically this fairway is triple three times, whatever it is, they get carte blanche. I don't know the hydrology to that. That seems totally misguided. Um, so, and I'll wrap with the other side of this is um, in the Southwest, so there, the, Lake P Powell that generates electricity is down. The whole, you know, kind of drought thing is here. So this seems somewhat reckless. Um, and that's my opinion. I just, it, I, I think of it as some of the generations later will look and they'll go, what were they thinking? I was like, oh, these boomers were into golf. And we had private equity funds and second homes and leveraging and, you know, no affordable housing and no kind of, it's kind of a little bit market cap, capitalism run adrift. So that I dislike about it. And I understand development and this progress. The other thing is the urbanization. I'm a bike rider. There aren't a lot of roads to ride around here that have good shoulders. The number of cars that will increase, just getting out on one uh, Highway 126 from Hemholtz or over here on 31st, I think, gets desperate. People do risky things. And uh, I would think they're going to put a traffic light there eventually, but it's all urban impact. And I think it's a little misguided, but I understand the developers. They, uh, they ask for a mile and hope to get a quarter mile. But, you know, I think uh, you have to be, once you let the horses out of the gate, um, can you claw back these water allocations? Do they, you know, get unlimited green paradise? So thanks for your time. And um, like I said, I think this is a little short of, of a rift because we're doing this Zoom, but COVID goes away on Saturday. So as far as public input, I don't know what the metric is. Like I talk and I have pervasive David, arguments for do, two minutes. Please do wrap up. I will. And so my point is, I think this is sort we deserve more than just Zoom. This is a joke. If you're going to send this land into perpetuity of locked out public access. Thanks again. Thank you. OK, hey Kayla, go right ahead. Jesse, you're up next. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. OK, thank you. Um, hi there. My name is Shayla. Um, I'll keep this as short as I can. I have so much to say, though, but thank you for this time to speak. Um, the activities that are predicted to take place on the um, 400 acres after purchase um, support an upward trend in climate change, further worsening the climate change crisis that we are already in. Um, as moral agents of this land, which each and every one of us are, it's our duty to preserve these spaces so that future generations can also partake in the decisions and activities that we are um, today here enjoy and find enriching in our lives. Um, so with that said, I adamantly oppose of this sale. I hope that you will value the concerns of the many folks who have spoke against this sale. And also just remember that today it's our land, but tomorrow it's it's could be somebody else's. So what we do today really matters for our future generations. Thank you. 
Thank you, Shayla. Jesse, you are up now, followed by Catherine Foster. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jesse. I was planning on just being a listener and not speaking today, um, but felt the need to say something as I listened to all of our amazing community members share their thoughts. I grew up in Terrebonne and I've seen Central Oregon change immensely over the last 25 years. I've seen friends and neighbors suffer the loss of their crops and livelihood after losing their water rights due to the continuing loss of water in our community alongside our ever-changing climate. I have seen the addition of numerous multi-million dollar second homes, resorts, and we have plenty of golf courses. I understand the importance of the Common School Fund. Um, similar to the gentleman who talked about going to Tumlo School District, I went to Terrebonne and Redmond School District, and I personally benefited from the school systems in Central Oregon. It's important to look at this money holistically and review the negative impact that the sale will have on our community. Our water is not an unlimited resource and we need to act accordingly. At this point, any loss of wild land, natural resources, and water will be detrimental to our school-aged children. Selling this land to a developer that plans to use up to 6 million gallons of water a day while disrupting the natural environment does not serve our community, and it will not serve our children. I hope that future generations of young Oregonians will have the same opportunities that many of us had growing up in this beautiful space. I do not support the sale of this land. Um, thank you for providing this forum, and thank you to everyone who is using their voice to conserve our natural resources. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, Catherine, please go ahead. Up next will be Susanna DeFazio. Hi, I'm Katie Foster. I'm from Tumalo. Um, I'm currently a student, um, but I'm going to be a doctor of medicine in eight days. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the kids as well. Uh, when we put money into our public schools, we're putting money into combating inequality and into protecting the vulnerable, in this case, children. Through education, we hope to safeguard our children's future in large part, we hope to prevent a world where the wealthy trample the vulnerable. As Oregon has evolved over time, we need to ask how to best safeguard our children's future, which addresses the intent of the Common School Fund and extends beyond that to preserving a world with space for them to play, interact with nature, and potentially be able to afford a home in the place where they grew up. We know medically that exercise and access to nature are key components of physical health for children, the sale of this land goes against all of these aims. And so while it may seem to monetarily support the common fund, in reality, it disregards its intent. I oppose this sale. Thank you, Catherine. Susanna, please go ahead. Up next will be Abby Kellner Road. All public land needs to be subject to the highest standards of stewardship. Um, a golf course is worse than a biological wasteland. It's actually a biohazard due to the application of chemicals, of toxic chemicals. And six fake lakes, seriously, I'm amazed that that's even legal. Um, what is the evaporation that happens on a 110 degree summer day from six fake lakes? Um, it, I think that this whole concept for this resort in this place is beyond reckless. It's actually quite destructive and doing no favors for our children or future generations to rob them of the precious nature that we have here. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Okay. Abby, before you speak, I'm going to say we've got 10 folks less left. We're going to go for it. Please. Um, you know, be, be as concise as you can possibly be. There is the opportunity to provide written comment. Um, I'm going to read out the names of the folks who are signed up right now. Um, if I don't read your name, please, please don't raise your hand. We're gonna get to everybody who's had their hand up. So it's gonna be Abby, Cindy, Jim, Link, Freddie, Canny, Carrie, Christine, um, and Joe K. And then that's gonna be it. Okay, Abby, go ahead. I am totally opposed to the sale for all of the reasons that have already been mentioned and more. As a farm owner of Boundless Farmstead, I am especially concerned about how our state has not prioritized the use of water while we watch our precious water disappear. I would like to request, this is one thing that I haven't heard said yet at all, and that is, I would like to request all of you who are against this sale, and or originally there were about 300 people 
here. Now it's much less, but I would like to rest, request that all of you who are against this sale to directly contact the state land board, which is comprised of only three people. I don't know if you realize that, but they're the people who are gonna be making the decision. Those three people are our governor, Shema, Shamia Fagan, who is the secretary of state and the state treasurer, who is Tobias Reed. I think that they need to hear directly from us, not to be heard just filtered through the um, people who spoke earlier about what they were gonna do and their, their plans to, um, give our, our uh, ideas to them. I think we need to contact them directly, just bombard them with information from all of us. And I hope you all will. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abby. Um, Cindy Phillips, please go ahead. Sorry for the delay. I have a problem with my mute button. Anyway, uh, my name is Cindy Phillips. I just wanted to go on record as opposing this uh, land sale, especially the sale of 5300, tax lot 5300. But after listening to everybody else, I realized that it, the sale of any of this land is going to be extremely detrimental to natural resources and wildlife, um, you know, all, all the things we love about Central Oregon. Um, I will be submitting written comments, so I need not take any more time tonight. Thank you. Thanks very much, Cindy. Jim Gilt, you're up now. Link Olson, you'll be next. Hi, my name is Nunzi Gould. I'm wondering if uh, the uh, deputy director, Bill Ryan, is listening in. I don't see his photograph on the video screen, and I have a question specific to him. Is he still uh, available for a question? He is here, Nunzi, but this is the comment, the comment time. So at the end, I'll put the, we'll put the, um, Right. So I, and as part of giving way. comment, as part of giving comment, it's important that those who are writing up the comments are actually there to hear into the comments. So I'm seeing his presence now. My question for Mr. Ryan is, there is mention of rights of way across the state lands. And I'm wondering if you could upload to the website a map that would show where those rights of way are. So the other issue I have is you're asking for public comment on information that hasn't yet been provided to the public. And so I would request that there be additional public comment time after you've uploaded all of these various surveys uh, to your website so that public comment can actually comment on what you're providing, the appraisal, uh, the various analyses, Perhaps you might even consider a map of the existing trails that are on the lands, um, et cetera, et cetera. So right now you're asking us to comment pretty much in the dark on things that are a little bit obsolete. And I wanna share with you that the state has owned some of this land since 1929 and really has not done a whole lot of due diligence to understand even how the land is used. So I would hope at least uh, that those of you who are overseeing this project would get out onto your land and have a chance to experience these amazing assets that we have. Klein Buttes is a multiple Buttes geologic feature. And these tax lots, not all of them, but a majority of them, uh, sit on the east-west ridge line between the tallest FAA butte and the smallest butte that is bisected by Bar Road. There currently is plenty access to get onto these state lands, so you don't actually need a right-of-way. You can access it from public lands, and people have been doing that for a very long time. In fact, before DSL acquired the 240 acres through the in loose process, there was huge public outcry and it would be really nice to know if 
uh, Mr. Ryan or Mr. Swanson or Mr. Zumwalt, I know Mr. Zumwalt was present, but if the other people involved in this process are even familiar with the public outcry that occurred when the state wanted to acquire 5,000 acres east of Bar Road. So the issue now is how are these lands being used and, and what type of public input are you actually looking to receive and honestly integrate into your report to the governor, the treasurer, and the secretary of state. The recreational and scenic values on these lands are tremendous. The trails are tremendous. There's huge vegetation and you can get to it from public access. So we really need these investigative reports to be released so that your process is actually um, not just kindergarten style, but actually respects the intelligence of the community here to give you input on the information that you're supposed to be compiling. Nancy, please, please wrap up. Yes. The final thing is I learned in October from the director of DSL that not all of your land has been mapped eligible for destination resort. And I think at the very least, there should be something on your website that shows which tax lot was not mapped as eligible for destination resort. And Thank there is a very much, big Nancy. difference. Okay, up next is Link Olson. Um, we'll hear next from Freddie Finney, Jorday. Okay, hi, thank you to DSL for this opportunity and for all the other people who've already testified tonight. My name is Link Olson. I grew up in Matters, Oregon. I'm a proud product of Central Oregon's public education system. And I definitely agree with the need for additional funding for public schools, but I oppose this land sale. I don't think the long-term costs are worth the short-term gain. I wanna point out as a biologist, I've spent a lot of time over there. I live right across Klein Falls Highway from the land under consideration. And at 60, or at 60 miles per hour driving by, it might look like all the rest of Central Oregon, but it's really not. And if you get out and spend some time, you'll see there's a remarkably intact sagebrush bunch grass ecosystem there that includes a really high density of pre-settlement, or you can call them old growth juniper trees that sort of represent ecosystems unto themselves. And I just encourage people that do spend time out there to get up close to some of those uh, they provide remarkable habitat for cavity nesting birds and mammals and are, are remarkably understudied. But I've been all over Central Oregon and Southeastern Oregon's high desert, and it, it's really remarkable land there. So don't think of it as just another uh, expanse of uh, juniper trees and sagebrush. So again, I oppose this sale, and I thank everyone else who's testified tonight. Thank you. Thanks very much, Link. Um, Freddie, 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 you're up now. 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 I'm joining in on my phone. Um, can you hear me? Okay, cool. Yep, we can. Hello, thank you. I've lived here all my 20 years, and I'm glad to see Central Oregon expand. But in recent years, it has expanded not with affordable, high density housing, but with a cancer of environmentally devastating, sickly affluent golf courses and resorts. I, for one, would gladly pay more taxes to our schools or do whatever else is necessary than have our landscape, our environment, and our local economy unempathetically starred in the name of greater affluence at all costs. I passionately oppose the sale. Thank you very much, Freddie. Christine, um, you are up next, followed by Joe Kay. Hi, thank you for letting me speak tonight. My name is Christine Seibert, and I'm... Um, couldn't have said it better than everybody that spoke here tonight, but um, I want to say that I am in extreme opposition to the sale of this land on Klein Butte. My husband and I are both avid hikers and bikers who enjoy being outside and hiking around Klein Butte. We hike there multiple times during the week. We love the trails that lead to the scenic overlooks. We love the shade provided by the juniper, the smell of the juniper, the beautiful blueberries. Um, the birds uh, and the wildlife that share this, this wonderful high desert habitat. We love the peace and solitude 
And I didn't hear this uh, said, but I wanna emphasize the dark skies that you have here in Central Oregon. And um, if there is a development placed on these in this area, uh, you will definitely lose that. Um, my husband and I moved here from Pennsylvania and we know what it's like to experience unchecked sprawl and, and mismanaged development. And we would hate to see something like that happen here. Um, we are extremely disheartened to learn that Oregon DSL is considering to sell out to a, to a corporate entity, the Central Oregon Land and Cattle Company for private use and profit. And uh, I guess one, to emphasize again that we are opposed to this. We would like to see that this land is kept wild, protected from development, unfenced for full public access. And please do not allow this short-sighted sale to occur. Thank you again for your time today. Thank you, Christine. Joe Kay, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Joe Kasanovic. I live in Eagle Crest and I put out a petition that was signed by over 311 people opposing this sale. Um, the DSL should not agree to this acquisition because it would impact the direct use of recreational lands and trails used by Eagle Crest owners, their vacationers, guests, and most importantly, all of Central Oregon enthusiasts. And I'm hearing people that come down even from Washington. Accordingly, this potential sale would violate the mission of DSL and their legal requirements under Oregon law, which is Oregon 274.670. It says DSL should consider whether potential easements or leases would interfere with recreational areas. And that is it really sums it up. That is a recreational area. So we oppose that. The 311 that signed a petition uh, oppose that as, as well as I do. I would thank you for the time and uh, thanks for hanging in there. <laughs> thank you, Joe. Okay, uh, Kenny, you're going to be our next speaker. And then our last speaker of the evening is gonna be Sam Schreiner. Kenny, go ahead. The other. Okay. Are you there? Here. I've oh, unmuted perfect. it. Okay. Great. Any, we can hear anyway, you. I'm opposed to the reason we all um you hear me? No. You're, bre you're breaking up some. Okay. Next. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yep, just keep trying. We can hear you now. Go right ahead. Okay. I'm opposed to the sale. And um, as we argue for our community, I find the most ironic thing is that we're arguing to protect our community. But the one person we haven't heard from or entity we haven't heard from is Thornburg. They don't have to argue to, for a reason why they do what they want to do. They're getting to do it and all they have to do is offer money. We're fighting to save our community. They're not offering any argument as to what they do for our community. Kenny, you are frozen. Um, thank you very much for, for okay. doing your best. Um, please I'm sorry. Some I just, it's okay. Um, the thing is, I think Thornburg hasn't offered they're not off org, but we're fighting for our community. And I think Thornburg hasn't, all they're doing is building buildings and we're fighting for the betterment of Central Oregon. That's my we, comment. We got it. Thank you very much. Okay, Sam. Um, Sam, you are our last speaker this evening. Thank you. Um, this is Spring Alaska Shriner. Uh, my husband, Sam Shriner, born and raised Camp Sherman. Um, I'm a female tribal owner of a local farm here in Tumalo, Oregon. We are one of the only uh, tribal farmers here in Deschutes County so far. And we uh, highly oppose this land acquisition. Um, Crescent Lake is at 9% right now. We just got a letter from Tumalo Irrigation District that we will if we get water, it'll be at half capacity at least. Um, and I just wanna ask, 
do you have any tribal representation as a tribal member here um, on the state land board review team? Um, remember you are originally on tribal lands and it is highly inappropriate to even consider the sale right now, considering there is no water for our farmers. We provide local food for this region and support our tribal members. So I'm, I'm pretty um, elevated at this moment, finding out we didn't have, we don't have water coming for our, our local growing season coming up. And it's embarrassing that you're not being transparent with the other community members here that are opposed. I've never seen so many people opposed to something uh, so important to us. So please get your ducks in a row, make things transparent and please get a tribal member to represent um, us on your state land board because these are tribal lands. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Okay, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Um, we greatly appreciate you taking the time to be here. The comments provided tonight and throughout the public comment process are ex an extremely important part of due diligence and in evaluating the potential sale and ultimately the sale decision. Um, the land board is going to be making the decision on whether or not to sell or retain these lands during a, during a future land board meeting. We've heard you tonight on making the due diligence information available um, and we will make what we can available as soon as we possibly can and certainly prior to the land board meeting. Um, land board meetings are of course open to the public and the land board of course accepts comment on action items. We anticipate the sale being before the land board in June at the earliest. Um, GSL provides land board meeting information as well as school land updates via email please, please, please sign up um, for email updates on land sales or exchanges on state owned land and state land board meetings. Um, the URL to do that um, is on the slide right there under the news pages subscribe. Um, one last plug for written comments. The comment deadline is March 17th. Please um, continue to provide, um, provide your comments on this potential sale. We're gonna leave this slide up for a minute in case folks would like to write this information down, but I am going to close the public hearing and say again, thank you all so much for joining us and good night.